said there's no such thing as free lunch? With ForkSpot, it's happy hour every hour. ForkSpot is a new food ordering app started right here in LA that allows you to order food in advance straight from the app and pick it up to take home with ease. You're in, you're out, no questions asked except... Is this your order? On top of that, ForkSpot has a reward system for every restaurant you visit in their app, which means that if you visit the same restaurant five times, you'll get a $5 credit. On top of on top of that, ForkSpot also has an exclusive partnership with these restaurants to offer you up to 30% off in discounts when you dine there. Right now, ForkSpot is active in LA and San Diego, but is soon coming to Seattle, Chicago, and New York City. Listeners of our show can use promo code MEEKLY to get a $15 credit immediately. No exclusions, no minimums, just $15 to gorge yourself and feel great about it at your favorite restaurant you using the ForkSpot app, available for download now in the App Store or on Google Play or at ForkSpot.com. That name again is ForkSpot. Now on with the show. Rosebud. In today's news, the world-renowned newspaper mogul Harrison Gray Otis has died due to severe age. He leaves behind his Los Angeles Times news empire, his beloved family and wife, and from the looks of his refrigerator, a bunch of Thai food. The only mysteries surrounding his timely demise were his final words. Rosebud, which could literally mean anything and nothing. Chiming in on the mystery, we go now to his brother, who also happens to run his beloved sled company. Rosebud? Never heard of her. <laughs> but seriously, my brother's dead. He never mentioned nothing about no Rosebud to me. We were always too busy talking about all the sleds we loved. He lived to talk about sleds, my brother. Frankly, I'm surprised his last word wasn't about sleds. Hey, you know who you should talk to? His best friend, an animated sled. Rosebud, I never heard of her. <laughs> but seriously, my best friend is dead. And I'm Sled. Nice to meet you. Yeah, me and Harry, we had a good time together. Mostly sledding. He ride me, I'd ride him. Lots of fun. Oh, did I mention that I was also his mistress? Oh, come to think of it, you should probably disguise my voice. I don't need his nagging widow in my case. Rosebud. Mm, nothing comes to mind. Oh, you know, I do remember he'd always talk about this real special sled he used to have. He gave it a name, but I can't remember. I think it might have been Toboggan. And there you have it, from the people in the cartoon that knew him best. Rosebud, Harrison Gray Otis' final words, a riddle that may never be solved. Where am I? He lives! This just did Harrison Gray Otis alive again. Mr. Gray Otis, your last word, Rosebud. What does it mean? Rosebud is honeysuckle. Oh. Honeysuckle? What does that mean? Well, he's dead for real now. I drove a stake through his heart to make sure this time, so I guess we'll never know. If you could have figured out what rosebud and honeysuckle meant, that would have explained everything, huh? No, I don't think so. Mr. Otis was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it all. Maybe rosebud and honeysuckle was something he couldn't get. Or something he lost. Anyways, better pack up my Honeysuckle brand staking mallet and head home on my Rosebud brand sled. What do we do with the body? Throw that junk in the fire. Wait, I'm still alive. Eh, the news cycle's moved on. But don't you want to know what Rosebud is? Not really. Ooh, I'll get you. No, you won't. Then I'll get your children where you can't protect them in their dreams. <laughs> had the craziest dream that referenced at least two different movies and one of them might have just been an episode of the simpsons well it's all right now it was just a bad dream now you're safe back here in 1955 no the third reference four <laughs> Episode something something of Ally Meekly begins in five. Oh no. Four. I'm not ready. Three. Oh no. Two. Live from Saturday know. night. Oh, oh, oh. I'm uh, glad that we're both doing two different things. <laughs> this is Ally Meekly, currently the only podcast not promoting I Am Night. Welcome. Is that a thing people are doing? Yeah. Isn't it I Am The Night? Oh, is it I Am The Night? I am the that's, dark why night. They, that's why we didn't get the phone call. <laughs> I've been promoting I Am Night Shyamalan. Oops. <laughs> 
Twist. Twist. That's the twist for you. I'm in Let's twist him. again. That should be his theme. His running theme. <laughs> is it weird that once I said I am night, I suddenly taste blood in my mouth? Just You bit into your cyanide I, tooth. I'm rubbing my gums right now because I taste blood. <laughs> With cocaine. He mentions a black dahlia one time and suddenly he tastes blood. Hello, meeklings. Hi. Those are our listeners. Thank you. I'm trying to get it going. Let's right hashtag it. <laughs> Did you hashtag the word before you said it? Do you think this could go viral with Chris Pine behind it? That's I am the night, right? Yeah, let's go viral. Yeah, I seriously think I'm bleeding right now. If I spit up a tooth midway, just know that it's a curse of the Chandlers. I'm cashing it in because <laughs> all of your teeth are gold. It's gold, baby. All of your teeth. Silver. <laughs> it's a joke about being poor and having to go to the dentist. I, if you think silver is poor, wow. Try living in the Bronze Age mm. that I'm living in. I was born uh, with um, a silver spoon in my mouth, but I was melted into a gold, <laughs> uh, to a silver cap. So. I was born a poor young silver spoon. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi. How's it going? Going. Welcome to February. February. Hope your first month in the new year Listen. has gone okay. Yeah, mine wasn't, but how was yours? I mean, as long as you were doing poorly, I was doing fine. We we only exist on the seesaw <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> and I see and stuff. you saw. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like how your wordplay sounds like it should work. I like how it sounds like you should work. <laughs> Okay, there it is. That's what you were going for. <laughs> I just needed to rev it. The engine needed to warm up. It's been a month. Cold month. Let's get right into it. What yeah. was? Uh, what did you do in the past month? I went to an art show at, I believe it's called the Regent Projects. It was for Glenn Ligon's show. I don't know I forgot this month. He's an artist, okay? I don't know if you ever heard of art before. Yeah, well, I'm an artist. You heard what I said about the seesaw? Uh, the show was called Untitled America, American parentheses. It was pretty nice. We got a lot of free wine, and it was like a Hollywood to-do art party. Mm-hmm. Glenn Legon was there. And, and? First, I saw Tracy Alice Ross. I'm like, pretty big deal. Diana Ross's daughter. Diana, as we all know. Co-presenter uh, of the Academy Award nominations. Owner of all Ross <laughs> store, the department yeah, Heir store. to the Ross heir department, to, yeah. fortune. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty big deal. And somebody came up and was like, you know, no, Malia Obama is here. Is that how you say your name? I always forget how to say your name. Is it Malia uh, or Malia? Been, all I know is, uh, what is Donald Trump's kid's name? Bruno? It's No, it's not Bruno. It's like ba- Baron. His name is... Baron. I was thinking it, it's not Baron. something stupid like Baron. It's Baron. This is my son, Detective yeah. Trump. <laughs> this is Air Trump. <laughs> the Obama daughter yeah, was the there. Obama, one uh, of the Obama daughters. She's very tall and pretty. And then we Weird. were like, can't get better than that, right? It's all, uh, you know, uh, yeah. American royalty. <laughs> And I turned around and Brad Pitt was there. And I thought, this is what people talk about when they go to Hollywood parties. And like, I turned around and Richard Nixon was right there. <laughs> Shaking hands with George Clooney. <laughs> and he passed behind me as he was leaving. And I could hear a voice I've been hearing in the movies for like yeah. 15 years. And it, I heard his voice pass from behind me. And it was the weirdest <laughs> sensation. What quote from what movie of his was he saying? He, You know, he was quoting he was quoting the Mexican as he was leaving. Quote the Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Luca. Thanks. Nunca mas. We put all our Spanish together and we're able to come up with one thing that's probably not right. We came up with one order for Del Taco. That's all we could muster. An order that's... Someone say mustard? Quality wordplay. Once again. Well, maybe you could pass the mustard and uh, pick up the game. What'd you do? Okay. Well, what I did was I took advantage of a new program from the Los Angeles Public Library Uh called Discover and Go through LAPL. Go to lapl.org slash explore LA. That's the thing where if you have a library card, you can get free tickets to many things in town. Some of the things are limited, like you can only do this once a year per card. I was able to go for free to the Grammy Museum. I went to the Museum of Jurassic Technology and I went to the zoo all for free, all within a week and all for free. Yeah, I remember getting all those text messages. (laughs) Greg, now I'm at the zoo. What was your fate? I mean, I'm sure you've been to the zoo many times before. Natural History Museum was the other one? No. Grammy Museum. Grammy Museum. I mean, if the the Jurassic Technology is your Natural History Museum, you know it's not real. The Natural History Museum is one of the places you can go, actually. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, of course I like the zoo best of all, but the Grammy Museum was fun and the Museum of Jurassic Technology is... Uh, it's the same as everyone describes it. The rooftop is very nice. It is weird, but the rooftop is... The feel of the whole museum is nice. And I hate... Because I could never really understand what it was. What was throwing me off is that people keep describing it as a joke. Or, or it's like it's not a joke. Yeah, it's not. But a it's joke. also not serious. No, it's not serious. It's a pair. It's a satire of what a museum yeah. is. Like it's not funny. But that's the thing. Like so many people who are in love with it, they're like, oh, it's so funny. It's, it's not it's, funny. No, it's not funny at all. Yeah. Like it's just a. It's an art piece. Yeah, I read a thing about it. I was saying something along the lines of like it's the history of folk tales or something like that. Well, there are some rooms, but that's the thing. Like I don't know what was real. I kept writing that stuff down, m- and Melissa kept being like, "Stop! It's not real. Stop writing this down." But now. that's the thing about folk. Folk tales is there's no f- real 
facts behind it. So but you some could, of these like, things are a, like, this person did this, yeah. and I was writing this person's name down, and there's no such thing as this person. Like, folk tales is what I'm saying. Like, there's like the, we know the stories, even though we don't know the stories of what's happening there. There's no facts behind any folk tales or anything. So but these aren't even folk tales. Like, I, I guess know they're what making you're saying. their it's own the, folk tales. Yeah, they're making their own folk tales. It's yeah. the, within the spirit of a folk tale, I mean, a history devoted to folk tales. Yeah, mm, sort of. I think that's a misleading... Fair. It just go, just go for yeah. free. <laughs> it, I mean, if there's one thing going for it, it's hard it's to describe, and it's free. <laughs> you saw something good at the Grammy Museum. I forget what it was though. I think you saw like eight hours of a Coltrane documentary, or something, <laughs> some weird thing. I was the, the only one sitting in the John Coltrane exhibit. My favorite thing at the museum was the interactive board. That it's this digital thing, mm-hmm. and it just has every single type of music like uh bebop whatever yeah doesn't that's the only type of music i know <laughs> bebop something with an accordion you can click on any type of music and then it'll tell you like the story of that music and it'll play you like three oh, songs okay. or like three clips of three songs screamo, and get that. screamo 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 <laughs> over and over again <laughs> what is rap core <laughs> can i buy this album of limp biscuit <laughs> what's the other one lincoln park and uh papa roach is another one yeah. or uh who, who did sugar butterfly oh. <laughs> <laughs> i think the band was called sugar butterfly but yeah, that interactive sound listening thing was that right there is worth the free admission. Yeah. It's a the whole thing is was interesting. It was a good place. And of course the zoo is great and I yeah. love to see animals in prison. You don't know dead. anything about animal conservation. You fat cat <laughs> with your gold teeth. <laughs> I want all the lions just running around the streets of yeah. Los Angeles. My streets in particular. What pictures I forgot what country it is, but there's just pictures of people like walking down the street with grocery bags and there's just like wild animals attacking them. And I thought that's how Belgium. It's, it might be Belgium. It might be Colorado. Colorado. Is that a country? It I is in the world cultures. of uh, Philip K. Dick. And I am talking about the man in the high castle. And now with their laws and how it is the high castle uh, over yeah. in Colorado. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wordplay. Yeah, I, get I, I see where you're going with this. I don't know if you realize where the wordplay was. Was High has a double meaning. It could mean high and it could mean high. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> oh, third, three. Well, let's get to our listener question from yes. this month. It's someone who's asked a question before. It's from Uranga Emilio on He's Instagram. Very curious. He wants to know. He's he curious. can't get enough. <laughs> if LA were a drink... What would it be? I like this question a lot. It just was hard had, for me to come up with an answer. We had sub questions. Does this mean a drink drink or an alcoholic drink? Does it yeah. mean a drink that we can make up? Yeah. Or is, is this, this a, a real thing or drink? do we make the drink? If it was an, a drink that I've had before, you know, there was a summer where I was drinking a lot of rock stuff. Star with Jägermeister. And I, it was the I, summer of Warp Tour. The it, summer that Warp <laughs> Tour never ended. <laughs> and it has such a summery taste to me that it, I, I think that if Ali was drinking, it'd be something really trashy like Monster Energy drink and really and something really awful and undrinkable yeah. like Jägermeister. My answer also will show what we really think of the city, but yeah. you were trying to think of something that's like, it looks classy, but it's made of trash. Yeah, like almost champagne with gold glitter in it, but the glitter is actually like razor blades. Yeah, and yeah. it's actually uh, urine. What I came up with was L is when you want every soda at the soda dispenser and you put them all into one because the, the city has everything yeah. and in the end what you get it just tastes like bubble gum and you're not completely sa- no one's really satisfied but yeah. you have everything but you have everything exactly that's, that's good yeah. I like that I like that too put a little Jaeger in there top it off <laughs> This episode brought to you by Monster. <laughs> I want to get a sponsor that asks us when we do a really horrendous episode to use that name of the killer as the promo yeah. code. Because I'm watching Zodiac and it's like, enter Zodiac. Use promo code Unterweger. Yeah. <laughs> I really want when I enter the promo code for Zodiac to be like backwards K, square, square, <laughs> circle. Like I want to have to put his name in like on the code he sent out. If you mail this in made up of letters <laughs> from different newspapers, get 10 years off your sentence. So let's get into this month's episode. We wanted to, we got one comment about a month or so ago like hey I love the show but you know the last few months it's been kind of lighter topics fast food yeah. haunted things whatever well here's something hard for you well, f- <laughs> well this month we're going to be talking about the LA Times as yes. you already know from from our hilarious title that we must have come up with we must have come up with it somebody had sent us a message a while ago saying he really liked the podcast which is a lie uh, <laughs> right there like we knew this? it was a bot <laughs> saying oh do you have more stuff about Chandler because I, my, he knew somebody who was related to oh, Chandler yeah. and he that wanted was a really more, long time ago he was ago. laughing at them every time we bring them up and it's bad news that yeah I'm, and we probably got that message like three years ago yeah. and I was like yeah the episode's right around the corner yeah well the corner's here it's a long block city block turn on the corner mugging <laughs> because this is such a huge thing it like is we, very I've already covered in a previous episode the bombing yes you did so that took a load off of my part but yeah we're mostly going to be focusing on the men and it was men yeah. who started it and sort of made it what Carried it is it, yeah and they're all from the same family which and and also all have the same name 
Yeah, and they kept naming their kids the names Saban. of their father. But and then I mixed literally... with... It, yeah. Let's go down just so we know. Okay. Harrison Gray Otis, Harry Chandler, Chandler. which is... Harrison, Harry, same name. Yeah, and then they ha- he has Norman, Norman Chandler, Chandler, and then Otis, Otis Chandler. Chandler. And I think Otis has a son named Norman, and I think uh, Norman had a son named Harry or yeah. something. I, yeah. I seriously try to map it out, and I couldn't keep track of all the stuff. And there's no definitive thing online. So, like, I really stuck to the main people in charge, but there's yeah. a whole network of Chandlers right. that extend yeah. from that, that I'm not going to even cover. Chandler Bong, uh, Chandler, Chandler Bing also. You Chandler. keep saying Chandler Bong. It's I Chandler went, Bong. I've got Colorado on the brain. I went through an old episode to listen to harry chandler on another topic and you you made another chandler bong joke i heard that joke at a very formative time in my life (laughs) (laughs) when i was in the womb my mom would play the episode to me on repeat this is the voice of our generation (laughs) young harrison i was supposed to be harrison but to make things even more confusing because i I covered harrison gray otis he had another family member who was maybe more famous than him also named harrison gray otis so when i'm trying to do research on harrison gray otis there's two worlds of harrison gray Otis yeah. and I had to be like oh my god he wrote the Federalist Papers oh no, he was not born that was a hundred years before he was born I also read a lot of things that had it wrong like my my go to Los Angeles A to Z encyclopedia that I usually go to just for basic information it was talking about Otis Chandler but it called him Norman Chandler or something along those lines <laughs> and it's just so like like the, my dependable really things confusing, are wrong but we're here to clear it all up Jesus. once and for all I'm very curious to hear about Harrison Gore Otis because you told me not to go near him and no, I keep don't. reading snippets I'm like who is this guy <laughs> We have tiptoed around him in other episodes, yeah. but it, let, here he is. The times they are a starting. God damn it. I always wonder how you're going to... What Bob Dylan song is he going to... Uh, what Bob Dylan song are you going to use to battering yeah. ram the door down? I can't just knock. You can't Yeah, I, you can't knock. You have to kick the I hinges. Assume, the world of knowledge has barricaded itself <laughs> from me. And I have to break it. In. I have to break in there like the Urukai storming Minas Tirith. <laughs> What? If you bring up Tolkien again, I'm walking, and you can call any one of your friends who live nearby. I, I can't guarantee that he's not in here get, somewhere. Uh, Daniel just pulled out a red pen out and went to page four and crossed something out, just so you know. Mm, change Samwise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, now he's uh, Mikey from the Goonies or whatever. Uh, Rudy. <laughs> is, is a, uh, okay, so let's get started. Okay. In the mid to late 1800s, LA was in transition. It was trying hard to move away from its Wild West lynch mob loving past that it had settled into since America took over. Oh. Over. Party's over. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. These lamos, these wet blankets <laughs> taking over our fun. So the city was reinventing itself into something remotely humane. Yeah. Dare it, I say modern. D- you daren't. A sign of that happening was that newspapers started popping up instead of the town crier who would get shot for telling everyone that the saloon was out of molasses chips mm-hmm. or whatever was happening in this wild west. One by one, little newspapers started to sprout. And one of these was called the Weekly Mirror. Okay. It opened February 1st, 1873 by two guys named Jesse Yarnell and TJ K style again still old west names and it wasn't so much a newspaper as a pamphlet of advertisements for the printing business that they owned <laughs> But they called it a newspaper. Now, Yarnell had been a founder of the Evening Press, which was the first paper of this new boom time in LA, which that started March 27th, 1871. But he left that to start what was the city's only printing business with K-Style. So they were the only ones in town. They wanted to get the word out. So they just print these pamphlets, basically just say, look how good we are. Look at how well printed. Stories to tell. um, Look at how well printed this is. You too could be well printed. Extra, extra, you can get your extra story at wherever we're located. Extra, extra, we charge extra. (laughs) They just called the newspaper Yarnell he would walk around downtown handing this out to anyone that would take it hoping people would see the beautiful printing and hire them to print stuff for them out of their office which is at 9 Temple Street at the corner of New High Street on the Downey Block they were called the Mirror Printing Office and Book Bindery they had zero interest in newspapers they just printing they just like printing Yeah. enter two more names you've never heard of there was Nathan Cole Jr he was the son of a rich guy from St. Louis and then there was Thomas Gardiner who is a flamboyant middle aged Englishman who was walking around dressed in full Victorian clothing and what was still the Old West. Oh like everyone God. was in chaps and he's going around dressed like Hipster. Sweeney Todd. Hipster. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I imagine he laughed. <laughs> they got shot by some guy. Looks like Yosemite Sam. <laughs> he had also been the editor of the Sacramento Union, which was a legitimate paper up north. So he ended up linking up with Cole, who somehow had no money from his rich dad. But the two knew they wanted to start a newspaper. So they saw one of these issues of the Weekly Mirror and went to Yarnell and Cass their office to make a proposition. Yarnell and Castile had the printing facilities and a fake notion of owning a newspaper and Gardiner and Cole wanted to run a newspaper. So the 
four men linked up and brought in a fifth guy named S.J. Mathis to become editor. And on December 4th, 1881, the first issue of the Los Angeles Daily Times came out. It was this weird mishmash of people who didn't seem to want the job and all came together to do a job they didn't want to do. Yeah, exactly. And nobody cared about it in the least. No, not at all. It was four pages long. It cost a penny. It was just half block text news articles and half advertisements. That's all it was. And most of the actual articles were just copied and pasted from newspapers on the East Coast. (laughs) Nobody's going to notice. How how would you notice back then? That's true. But then how'd they get the paper? I don't know. Someone's noticing. Someone's noticing and someone doesn't care. Lincoln shot again. (laughs) We got to get these delivered quicker. (laughs) This just in, America discovered. (laughs) There was a story about a guy in Philadelphia who threw a bottle of acid into a crowd of people. There was a story about a boat in Newport that ran over a whale. There was a story about a rubber leg that they found in a morgue in Paris. So that was the, that was the sorts of things they were writing I'm about. I'm more surprised that they had rubber. Thus, journalistic integrity was born. <laughs> the paper came out every day except Monday, and they ran out of money within weeks. Okay. They almost went bankrupt immediately. Like every other newspaper I've always They were way ahead of their times. <laughs> times. Times. They were capable of printing 500 copies an hour, but fish kept getting stuck in the water wheel that they used to run the presses, so they had to keep stopping them. <laughs> My eye just did a thing, like it automatically shut. Welcome to the Old West. Oh my God. Welcome to the transition of America. There's fish everywhere. Welcome. (laughs) Fish was as good as gold back then (laughs) until gold came in. And it was all about gold. Like your teeth. They're silver. My Um, teeth are made of fish. But aside from that, they just weren't successful. And Mathis hated being the editor, but they decided to double down and keep pushing forward rather than pack it in and cut their losses. I know you hate it, but... Keep doing it. I know you still have a little money. You don't need that. (laughs) But then on July 28th, 1882, just seven long bankrupt months later, a savior stepped in and changed everything. That savior, one of the biggest villains slash heroes this city has ever seen. The Riddler. Harrison Gray Otis. He's the Riddler? He's the Riddler. Oh, oh, I wasn't supposed to say. He was born February 10th, 1837, the youngest of 16 kids on a farm near Marietta, Ohio. It's a farm. It's a 16 kid. That's a small family. You're you're giving birth to your employees. Yeah. yeah. If you want to make harvest, you You got to start harvesting. It's harvest You got to start producing. If you want to make produce, you got to start producing. (laughs) That's the motto of the Midwest. (laughs) He came from a pretty significant family for America, despite him living on a farm in Ohio, though. His parents, Stephen and Sarah, were actually some of the first pioneers in Ohio. And Marietta, which is the town they lived in, that was the first settlement in Ohio. That's Uh, a big deal. Yeah, for Ohio. Um, (laughs) His grandpa was James Otis, who was the guy who said taxation without representation is tyranny. That was his grandpa. Wow, really? It's weird. This guy is a part of American history, and it's weird that he's not talked about more. Harrison himself, like I said, he was named after his cousin, Harrison Gray Otis, who was a famous senator whose main job was to confuse a lot of my research. (laughs) But our Harrison, I'm going to call him Harrison to make things easier. HGO? HGO. (laughs) Double A, HGO. HGO. So he grew up working on the family farm and going to school during the winter when there was no farming to be done. But all this only amounted to three years of country schooling. I understand what that is. Yeah. He learned how to whittle for a year. (laughs) And then the year after that, he learned how to spit. (laughs) (laughs) That didn't really matter because at age 14, he took a job as a printer's apprentice at the local newspaper, the Noble County Courier, which he did. He worked there for years. During this time, in 1856, he decided to give higher education a try and enrolled at the Weatherby's Academy in Lowell. But the only subject that interested him was his teacher, a lot. Eliza Weatherby, who also happened to be the daughter of the school's founder. Not Flounder, not the kind that got stuck in there. Lowell, Massachusetts? I, I couldn't. There were different Lowells. Okay. I wasn't sure which one it that's was. That's where Kerouac's from. That's, oh, no. That's not that one. It. She was three and a half years older than him, but they fell in love. He called her Lizzie, and to make things more confusing, like I said, she called him Harry. Oh, God. <laughs> the two got married on September 11th. There's the date again, 1859, and moved to Louisville, Kentucky, because Harrison got a better job working at the Louisville Journal. They eventually had five kids with only three of their daughters surviving Mabel, Lillian, and Marion. Marion. You're going to be getting to, I think. A little bit. Huh. I guess women don't matter in this story. I know I said that at the beginning, but you're the one. You're living it. Listen, when we get the buff, I'll take, I'll, you know, I'll give you your ladies, okay? Buff? We'll get there. You're just flexing at me. I flexed on a Flex fool. alert and you start <laughs> moving your pectorals. Back in 1857, he had given education another stab at Granger's Commercial College in Columbus, Columbus, Massachusetts. <laughs> where Kerouac's from. And again, <laughs> that's where Herman Hess is from. <laughs> and again in 1861, he took a, about another year's worth of college before he decided that he actually just liked working in newspapers. Yeah. Why go to college? Here, but here. not more than he actually really liked being involved in politics. Harrison was a pretty liberal guy at the time, which is shocking when you hear yeah. what he has 
has to say, what I have to say in about 15 minutes. His dad helped shelter fleeing slaves on the Underground Railroad on their farm in Ohio on their way north. So that value system was passed on to Harrison and led him to join the Republican Party down in Kentucky when they were the good people. He was actually made one of the delegates to the Republican National Convention in 1860, where he helped nominate Abraham Lincoln to run for president. (laughs) I'm telling you, this guy is a part of American history. It's weird. But in doing so, he also saw that a civil war was brewing and he was deep in the South and wasn't he wasn't into that. So before that could start, he fled back north to Ohio, Ohio to be Ohio. Ohio, Oh, hello. To be part of the Union. And on June 12th, 1861, he enlisted as a private in the 12th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry to fight the rebels. Those pesky rebels and their love of the color gray and the color white. (laughs) Can we have white uniforms? I mean, it's pretty on the nose, but still. (laughs) In his four years in the army, he fought in 15 battles, was wounded at Kernstown and Antietam, which was the bloodiest day of the Civil War. He served under future assassinated President William McKinley and was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel by none other than not assassinated future President Rutherford B. Hayes, which is why from then on he insisted on being referred to as the Colonel, much to the annoyance of Mr. Sanders. After barely surviving the war with honors, he returned home to Murrieta, where he got a job as the publisher for the Washington County news for the next 18 months before he was finally able to combine his two passions of kind of being interested in newspapers and really liking politics in 1866 when he was elected as the official reporter of the House in the Ohio legislature. At this point, he was able to pull all the strings he had grabbed a hold of during his time in the Civil War, which if you didn't die, seemed to be a great networking opportunity. <laughs> I got a plan. I get, I'm going to kill and my I'll, own brother. Uh, and I'll get a job. This I won't is, die this and is I'll my get five a job. Year plan. <laughs> in 1867, he moved to Washington, D.C. for several different reasons. He was made second lieutenant general in the regular army. I don't understand military rankings at all. Yeah. He got a job in the government printing office, became the D.C. correspondent for the Ohio State Journal, and also the managing editor of the Grand Army Journal, which was the first newspaper for Union soldiers post-war. Oh, cool. Okay. You won. Here's what to do now. <laughs> Did we really win? That was the first issue. <laughs> Remember that time I fired one bullet and it took 18 minutes to load another bullet? Yeah. Death sounded brutal back then. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand how, like, do cannons explode? I don't get it. Like, do they just, so they just, like, barrel into everything? I'm pretty sure. It's but what a are the odds? Cannon. It's. I feel like the force of it is more powerful than the heat of it. But a cannon is small. You, burn. <laughs> your bruised and dead body will burn. <laughs> you don't want that. But I don't understand. Like, because a cannon's a small thing. Like, unless yeah. you're lined up, ten people well, in a line. I don't understand. Or whether they think, hit the ground and it would. But there's also dirt would fly on you. Formations too. Like yeah, they, they had a lot of formations, so you just shoot it into but a if, crowd of people you and you disperse. But if it's like, a, even if it is a line of ten people, the first five people get hit by the cannon, and you'll be like, oh, a cannon's coming. Better get out of the yeah. way. Yeah. Or it'll slow down. I don't know. Well, I mean, how or far it is it? goes through your stomach. It could go through your stomach. Yeah, old warfare is dumb. They should have... Native sh- Americans and their bows and arrows were pretty on point. Yeah, you literally. Did. There's your wordplay. You're good at this. You know, I went to college once. <laughs> it's a long time ago. And I then I young. dropped out to start a newspaper. <laughs> so during this time in D.C., he also became a delegate at the convention that nominated Ulysses S. Grant for president. Oh. So he, he nominated two of like the major presidents. That's insane. From here, he worked his way into the patent office in 1871. But by 1874, he and his wife were growing tired of the old crowded oh. East Coast and longed for a new way of life. Fate sh- sure. <laughs> I've got a new invention. Uh, <laughs> it's called boogieing. <laughs> I had a vision when I was watching Atlanta burn. <laughs> I thought if only there was water to put this out and I, I could ride the water. I pulled a young boy out of the wheat field and he was severed in half and he had dying words for me. And he said, Cowabunga. <laughs> <laughs> so fate shined upon them when they saw an ad in a newspaper to move to California to raise goats. So they immediately took a trip out there and they didn't like the goats. But Harrison fell in love with... Ca- I love goats. Again, you're putting animals down a lot this episode. And I, I don't like it. <laughs> oh boy. They fell in love with California. They really liked it. Okay. More so than the natural beauty and lifestyle, he fell in love with the financial opportunity in California. It's beautiful. You can see the checkbooks for miles. <laughs> On a clear day, you can see my bank account. I can exploit all of these people. Look at all these <laughs> All these friendly, rubbish people. When he came to visit LA that year, the city was, for lack of a better term, still a sleepy Pueblo town. Mm-hmm. But he said, it more than fulfills my expectations. It is the fattest land I ever was in. And from the pictures I've seen of him, he's one to talk. Uh, it, that it, he could fit in it <laughs> is telling. It took a couple more years, but in February 1876, he finally had his life in order enough to finally move out west to the City of Angels, Santa Barbara, uh, where he was able to take over the Santa Barbara press. I imagine at the time there was just a mission that was no longer in operation yeah. and Harrison. 
and an art gallery. An art yeah. gallery. <laughs> oh, yeah, an art gallery, maybe a craft brewery. A few homeless people. And Harrison Gray Otis. And Harrison Gray Otis. Sitting there on a rocking chair. He saw Santa Barbara as having potential to become the metropolis in Southern California. And if he had held... You stupid if idiot. He had, <laughs> in high, you should have had hindsight. <laughs> if he had held on to that belief, it might have been, but he lost yeah. interest in the city pretty quickly. He wasn't making... As we all do. <laughs> I mean, it's good for like an afternoon. <laughs> he wasn't making enough money from the newspaper and he still had hopes of a political career. So he had decided to get on the fast track to political power and fortune and accepted a job as the U.S. Treasury agent in the Seal Islands in Alaska. Oh, he made, wrong direction, he made ten, <laughs> Go north, young man. Okay. He made $10 a day and was in charge of keeping away poachers and making sure the local Inuits didn't drink alcohol. That was his job that the government gave him. <laughs> Putting soda into beer cans. Ah. Yeah, try some of my beer. <laughs> it's all the sodas in one. <laughs> he knew the essence of the city. He got it. If the Seal Islands could be a drink, it would be mm, Mountain Dew. He hated this. Yeah. He hated being there, but he sent all his money back to Lizzie so they could afford to start a new life away from Santa Barbara. Yeah. And she went hat shopping with it. Uh, so when he felt he had... You already have hats. <laughs> We don't need hats in the sun. <laughs> so when he felt he had enough money, he came back to Santa Barbara and saw that over in Los Angeles, there was a newspaper that was eight months old and failing and it was up for sale, the Los Angeles Daily Times. This was just the opportunity he was looking for. Mathis, the editor who hated being there, yeah. and a silent partner named A.W. Francisco learned that Harrison was interested, so they courted him to get him to come in and take over the paper from them, but the rest of the partners didn't want him. But they didn't really have a choice because yeah. none of them had money. None of them, not even Harrison, Gr Shh. like no, no, nobody, 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 involved, in the, nobody, nobody in the equation had money. <laughs> Everyone here wanted money and none of them had it. That's so funny. So, There's also people who want money the most. <laughs> at this time, he got offered another meaningless government job as the consul for the Samoan Islands, which could have given him more money, but he had to act now. So he yeah. sold the Santa Barbara Press and was able to raise the $5,000 for a quarter share in the paper on July 28th, 1882. And in October, he and his family moved to LA finally. The guy who replaced Harrison as the editor of the Santa Barbara Press, six months later, he published an editorial critic criticizing a local candidate for the DA office, and he was shot dead in the street by Whoa. that candidate. It was a brewery, <laughs> an art gallery, the old mission, a few homeless people, and one murderer. <laughs> so now Harrison was the new editor of the Los Angeles Daily Times, and he and his wife, Eliza, did almost literally everything for the paper. He would write the editorials, local news, find the clippings from other papers to publish and as their articles. He was also able to buy some telegraphic news when they could afford it. She would write articles on literature, women's life, morals, and religion. She had columns called The Saunterer and eh. Susan Sunshine and she would even publish her own poetry in the newspaper. An early issue had a poem of hers that I think should be the Pledge of Allegiance that we sing at the beginning of each of our episodes. Okay, let's hear it. Oh, you darling pansies, with your meek little faces and your airy fairy graces filling the garden's quiet places. <laughs> I think it's very fitting. It's very fitting. It sounds like it could be very pleasant in another era, but now it's all put down words. I think about that so many times. Like how many words have just flipped their flipped, meaning. Entirely <laughs> flipped. In the worst possible way. What was once poetry is now hate crimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hate speech. The both of them were also cleaning the place and doing all the day-to-day -day things. And Harrison made $15 a week doing this, but they were still a very small operation. Yeah. Then in late 1883, one of the original founders, K-Style, he died. So Harrison saw this power vacuum as a real opportunity. So he brought in another... He, he saw he saw this death and thought, how do I... He, how can I squeeze some he, opportunity out of this? He's the guy who came to LA and saw the beauty of the financial potential. So obviously, obviously. Uh, that's how he thought. What does this death mean for me? <laughs> What'd you do for me lately? <laughs> so he brought in another colonel, his rich friend who wanted to be a publisher, H.H. Boyce. He was also a former colonel. Together with Boyce, the two of them bought out the rest of the partners and forced them all out of the company, which I'm sure they were not sad about at all. Yeah, no, please buy me out. Yeah. So now Boyce and Harrison were the co-owners of the paper. Their next move was to gather up the sister paper of the Daily Times, which was the Mirror. So they incorporated the Times and the Mirror in October 1884 as the Times Mirror Company, which it never made sense to me why their old headquarters was called the Times Mirror Complex. Yeah. That's why it was the LA okay. Times and the Mirror. So those were the two original papers. The Mirror would slowly fade away as it drifted into just being printed once a week as part of the Daily Times. So it just kind of went it away. Fizzled away. It fizzled away. It fizzled away. It comes back later, but minorly. Are you fact checking me? Actually, I hate to do this to you, but... You better fact check I'm yourself. I'm itchy. <laughs> fact check yourself before you fact wreck yourself. This was when they decided to revamp the paper and make it into something with a little more appeal. To start 
all nudity. It's Playboy. Yeah. <laughs> I know we don't have pictures yet, but how can we make a centerfold? Can we just type a lot of dirty words and they fold it out? What's your mom doing? <laughs> pansy, pansy, pansy. Pansy, pansy, pansy. To start, they doubled the coverage, expanding it to an eight-page issue. That's okay. what it was now. Double size. Double the pleasure, double the fun. Then they made their headlines catchier, okay. you know, make it a little, a little more splashy. They added letters to the Sex editor. Sex guns. <laughs> Sex guns and rhythm and blues. <laughs> they added letters to the editor to get people more involved. Mm-hmm. Then in October 18, 1986, they removed the word daily from their name and became the Los Angeles Times. Okay. So now it's officially the it, Los Angeles it's Times. It's the Los Angeles Times now, even though it wasn't until the next year that they actually became daily to justify. To justify why it would be called <laughs> daily. It just sounds better. But they needed more writers who could share the workload and cover different stories. This will fill in another guy that we've tiptoed around. The first person Harrison got involved was our old friend Charles Fletcher Lummis. Oh my, okay. The man who literally walked to California. Wait till you hear why. Lummis was living in Ohio and became pen pals with Harrison after he got a few issues of the Times in Ohio and he liked the paper so much that he asked Harrison for a job writing it and Harrison agreed. That's why Lummis walked You are kidding. No, he wa- that's why he walked 3,705 miles from Ohio to LA the longest commute in history. That is ridiculous. For a job. How many times have we heard stories about like he came here for a job and the job wasn't there? That's when they had cars and planes and he walked here? This wasn't just some quirky thing. He agreed that along the way he'd send in letters that he would write like on his journey. This was all a publicity thing. Yes, exactly. It was a travel correspondence. So he was mailing them in along the way of his adventures and oh, they would publish okay. them in the Times to get more people interested. On the road. On, he's Jack Kerouac. <laughs> he's Herman Hess. <laughs> he's Siddhartha. By the time he showed up at the San Gabriel Mission on February 1st, 1885, after the 143-day journey, he showed up with a broken arm. He was already a local celebrity from oh, his things. Okay. That, this was all their plan. It was all publicity. Okay. That's pretty it's cool. Still, it's still cool. cool. I like that. I yeah. would love to read that. It's a lot It's a lot better story than what I thought before was like, he just couldn't get I'll a be ride. There in 100, I'll be there in half a year. Yeah, half a year. <laughs> Harrison met him at the mission that night. And that slave labor camp in San Gabriel? Let's meet over there. That's the one. Meet you by the whooping post. <laughs> they walked the last 11 miles into the city together, arriving at 11 p.m. And Lummis started work at 10 a.m. the next morning. Oh, my God. Not even a day nope. off. He became the first city editor. So that's uh, that's his story. The first reporter they hired who wasn't Harrison or Eliza or Lummis or anyone in their family was a man named Harry Ellington Brooke in 1886 as an editorial writer who was actually the guy who started Land of Sunshine magazine that oh, okay. Lummis later took over. Okay. What's his name? Brooke? Uh, Mel Brooks. Mel yeah, Brooks. That's the one. Harry Ellington Brook. Okay. Another Harry, by the way. Yeah, like we need another one. <laughs> All full, thank and you. And this guy, uh, he's Harry. He went by the nickname Otis, though. <laughs> they added William Spaulding as a telegraph editor and general assistant, a cabinet maker from Bavaria, which is a position at the time. <laughs> the official political position. <laughs> You're the cabinet maker of the cabinet? <laughs> this guy was named Frank X. Foffinger, and he became their bookkeeper, and he stayed for 50 years. Wow. So now they had a little team. However, Harrison and Boyce had a falling out in March 1880 and Boyce said he'd agree to be bought out for $27,000, which he knew Harrison didn't have. What he didn't know is that Harrison was deeply spiteful and very well connected. So he borrowed the money from several friends and got all of that money and kicked him to the curb wow. and made himself president, general manager, and editor-in-chief. He was in charge now. Boyce, then out of spite, started the Tribune to try to put the Times out of business. Really? Yeah. Problem was, they didn't go out of business. <laughs> <laughs> they just kept growing. In 1892, they added photography to the paper in the late 1890s, they added comics to the paper. They were becoming more and more appealing and their circulation kept growing and they raked in a lot of advertising money because they were ruthless and getting advertisers. What they would do is they would print articles, putting down something like a real estate company and then send a letter to that company saying, we'll stop printing these articles if you take ads out in our in our paper. And it worked. Oh my. Most of the ads seem to be for erection pills though. I'm not joking. I'll get to the name of one of them later. Like most of them are veiled like... Are you a little tired sometimes? Like it's, oh, it's like okay. veiled things like we know what these are. Just say it. Yeah, just say it. <laughs> this is Playboy. Just Does say a it. life living in mud not make you horny? Which meant something else. <laughs> are you a horny little pansy? <laughs> Which was a greeting back then. <laughs> so yeah, it was mostly erection pills and also an app to easily pick up food around town. That's what they were advertising. It uh, was called Trident Spot. 
They became successful enough to move out of their fish-clogging old headquarters into a dedicated new building that Harrison liked to call the Fortress. It was at the corner of First and Broadway, which was then Fort Street, actually, and was the first granite building in the city. The granite came from the mountains behind Monrovia. Oh, okay. um, from the mines of Moria. There's your Lord of the Rings Thanks. reference. You're you said welcome. you crossed it out. Uh, no, I got the Samwise one. I missed, I missed this one. It was three stories tall, and it cost fifty thousand dollars. It looked like a castle and had all yeah. these bells and whistles on it. Not literally, though. Castle don't have that. This is what blows up? This is yeah, this building. is the one that blows up. I've only known it as rubble. I've only seen the after picture. <laughs> it, it had a copy shoot between the business offices and editorial rooms. Yeah. It had a new steam engine press. They had new fonts they could use. Each department could communicate with each other through speaking tubes. Later <laughs> called phones. Later called throats. <laughs> it even had a front counter. We I know we talked about this yeah. in the bombing episode. It had a front counter supposedly made out of wood from both Union and Confederate ships. The California Missions and Lincoln's deathbed. I nominated him. I get a piece of his deathbed. We have a pen holder. It's actually Jesse James' skull. <laughs> Everything was made out of someone else's misfortune. <laughs> it said on the front of the building all the news all the time. And it also had the emblem of Harrison's motto, stand fast, stand firm, stand sure, stand true. That's the motto of Cobra Kai, isn't it? Wax on, wax off was the motto of the Tribune. <laughs> <laughs> it's wax like getting hit. Wordplay. <laughs> Everybody likes wordplay, right? It opened July 1st, 1887, but it wasn't until 1891 that the iconic Iron Eagle was put on top of it, which also took on another meeting <laughs> a few years later. Also an 80s movie. <laughs> but as much as we can talk about what the paper itself did, we have to talk about Harrison's personality because he had so much control over the paper, over the people, the paper, also the people over yeah. the paper, that who he was manifested it in newspaper form through the times. Yeah. You were getting Harrison Gray Otis delivered at your doorstep every morning. Oh That's what God, you were getting. That is so weird. Yeah. Most of this part of my story is best expressed through quotes people had about Harrison. Mm -hmm. Anything that is disgraceful, depraved, corrupt, crooked, and putrescent, that is Harrison Gray Otis. He was a large, aggressive man with a walrus mustache, a goatee, and a warlike demeanor. The military bee buzzed incessantly in his bonnet. He was a holy terror in his newspaper plant. His natural voice was that of a game warden roaring at seal poachers. He was politically <laughs> ambitious all his life. Though he never ran for an office, he asked for many. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty scathing. Yeah. He was described as a bully and a buffoon with the temper of a hungry tiger and that he approached life as if it were the Civil War battlefield of Antietam. As well, funny you yeah. should mention that. <laughs> funny you should mention that. I keep reading all these things like, you know he had nah. like, PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sufferer. I have a little a mercy. Veteran and a sufferer. As Loomis put it, he hated anybody who was afraid of him. He used the powers that came with running a newspaper ruthlessly. To start, he would constantly publish takedowns of the other papers in town to discredit them and the promote the battle? times. Yeah. He had beef. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Beef, a lot of beef, which helped them make a name for himself. Like that's okay. that really worked for them. But through his editorials, he set the tone and leaning of the times, which was right wing, conservative, racist. Yeah, that was what they were all about. To him, progressives weren't called progressives. Again, this is where he kind of like somewhere along the line he he flipped. He, he flipped. He got away from like Abraham Lincoln should be president. Yeah. My dad helped free slaves. I hate all people who aren't white. Like that. I don't know what happened. Money. <laughs> Again, I don't know if he. I don't know if he hated. You know. I think that... But I, he was racist. He There's was, no denying Yeah, no, I've he read, was I read stuff. Yeah. Uh, to him, progressives weren't called progressives. They were socialist freaks. Yep. He called labor leaders corpse defacers, and he called one governor a born mob leader. <laughs> Which, by the way, there's a lot of parallels yeah. to the current uh, guy who's in charge right now. Yeah. Has he not called someone a born mob leader? Yeah. Like, I feel like he's said that exact thing. The progressives are still being called socialist exactly. maniacs or whatever. <laughs> Reading this, at some point, I came up with a similar, like, oh my god, that that's just a tale that. as old as time <laughs> other enemies of his were called scoundrels un-american assassin like cowardly and anarchic scum and he had many enemies he had a lot of people to call this in the 1884 presidential election he wanted james g blaine to win but when grover cleveland won he printed stories for 11 days saying blaine won what did you do before you had twitter that's what you exactly. did you got a newspaper you got a newspaper and you just published uh, late edition everyone uh, wake up but i'm way better he once sabotaged a guy who he didn't want to be California Secretary of State by printing an article saying that this guy was in an orgy such as even the most salacious pen in ancient Rome never dared describe in a scene of absolutely sickening bestiality. 
<laughs> this really is Playboy. <laughs> and someone say sickening bestiality. <laughs> a progressive governor of California that Harrison hated said of him, the guy said this about Harrison, that he had gangrened heart and rotting brain, grimacing Whoa. at every reform, chattering impotently at the things with senile dementia. That's metal. That's granite. <laughs> His paper often distorted the facts to fit Harrison's agenda. Would and, you call it and, fake news? <laughs> he was sued for libel repeatedly. He just used that as more fuel for the yeah. fire. Here's what he had to say about Los Angeles. Los Angeles wants no dudes. <laughs> No fat chicks. Los Angeles wants no dudes, loafers, and paupers. People who have no means and trust to luck. No cheap politicians, failures, bummers. (laughs) No scrubs. I'm I'm not joking. He said no scrubs. Impecunious clerks, bookkeepers, lawyers. Bookkeepers. He already hired one from Bavaria. Doctors. He said no more doctors. He said the market is overstocked already. We need workers, hustlers, men of brains, brawn, and guts. Men who have a little capital and a good deal of energy. First class men. That being said, he hated the working man. (laughs) He despised the working man. You know what I hate about doctors is that I can't exploit them the way I can with just (laughs) some kid who walked in. How does a person go through the civil war and see all that death and then be like, doctors are phone or like uh, uh, like money. there's two money <laughs> i feel like at, at some point somebody killed the real harrison gray otis and like i can grow a mustache <laughs> they to killed, be fat they killed the real harrison gray otis and william mulholland filled in for. <laughs> as we know he was very anti-union yeah, as uh, we know the international typographers union called his times the most notorious most persistent and most unfair enemy of trade unionism on the north american continent <laughs> Which is weird because Harrison actually had been a member of that very union in the 1860s. Something just flipped in him. Yeah. He even quit a paper back then because they wouldn't let him join the union back in his old in days. In his old days. It, uh, yeah, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe he was killed. It's the Manchurian candidate. Yeah. Like something something <laughs> weird happened. Now he was printing op-eds regularly saying how bad unions are. The banner of the paper even said on it, true industrial freedom. When the real estate bubble burst in 1887 and the economy crashed, the Times cut back to four pages an issue and he lowered his workers' wages. So they striked. So Harrison yeah. got a bunch of scabs and actually increased his circulation oh. without his regular workers, Jeez. which caused the strikers to take the strike on a national level and yeah. asked advertisers around the country to stop working with the Times. But the strike kind of dissipated. I did not understand this story. They ran an ad for Mormon bishop pills, which were erection pills, and a bunch of women signed a boycott against it. And I guess people found that to be so funny that they just gave up on the strike and went back to work. I, I didn't, don't understand. I didn't understand. Under, I, I didn't understand the story, but that's what happened. It just became a joke that like women would get involved and uh, erection pills were what they were fighting over. And that shamed the strikers to stop. They were like, ah, oh, you're right. You're right. We don't Let's mean all, anything. Let them eat boners. Yeah. <laughs> but the real pinnacle of the anti-union fight happened on October 1st, 1910, mm-hmm. when the McNamara brothers blew up the LA Times building. You can hear the full story on our episode, the podcast The Time Forgot. 21 people were killed in the bombing, showing once and for all that fake news and wrongly and influencing people has consequences and no one ever took advantage of that again. The building was destroyed and the yep. second building was open on the two-year anniversary of the bombing on October 1st, 1912 at the same location. It was ready, but they wouldn't want to let people in until the anniversary. This will be dramatic. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin actually filmed his first movie making a living in that building in really? 1914. The uh, new building. Yeah. The, well, it's their third overall. Yeah. While it was being built, they were headquartered at 531 South Spring Street. His home life was also ridiculous. Harrison had a weird home life. His house was at 2 401 Wilshire Boulevard, right on MacArthur Park. It was one of the first homes built on the new Wilshire Boulevard, and he called it the Bivouac, which is a military term for a temporary camp with no tents. Of course, he was obsessed with weapons. So he had guns hanging from the ceiling of the house like a hillbilly mobile. (laughs) It's really weird. There's just like shotguns hanging from the ceiling. He even kept shotguns in the newsroom at work in case there was a labor uprising. Well, I could, like, it's funny because. It seems Bur- wacky, fool but fool me also, once. Fool me once. <laughs> it's not unjustified, it's not but un- hey, you. you it's did a. This. It's a. It's an intense reaction to yeah. that. <laughs> he drove a car that was custom built to make the horn on the front look like a cannon. I've been putting gas in the wrong one. <laughs> to get the horn to work, you have to put a bunch of gunpowder in there. <laughs> the McNamaras also had planted a bomb at the bivouac, but it was found and diffused before it went off. To spite them, though, he built a replica of the fortress that was about as big as a guest house on his front lawn, made out of the rubble of the blown up building Whoa. just to spite them. Three years after the bombing, somebody even sent a ticking stick of 
dynamite through the mail to the bivouac, but um, come on, try a little harder. Listen, we all saw Looney Tunes when we were kids. Doesn't mean you have to replicate it. <laughs> Special this delivery. Must be a clock. <laughs> he took his military career very seriously. He already called his office the fortress. His home was the bivouac. He called himself the colonel. He also called his staff the phalanx, which is another military term. Also a term for erection pills. His business cards just had a picture of him in his military uniform and a list of all his military ranks. Call me. Call me, Stop Colonel. Me. He was 61 years old when the Spanish-American War broke out mm-hmm. in, in 1898, which he had pushed for in the Times. And he asked his old friend, President McKinley, to appoint him Assistant Secretary of War. But the Secretary of War didn't want him because he was too conservative. He instead enlisted with the United States Volunteers and was made a Brigadier General. But by the time he got to the Philippines, the war was over. But he stayed to put down the Filipino insurrection that became known as the Philippine-American War. He commanded 3,300 men, and he was good at it. Wow. Like all this boastfulness actually it, it has got a the job done. When he got home, he promoted his everyday nickname rank. And from then on, he insisted on being called the general. For the best newspaper slander in town. <laughs> unfortunately, not long after he got home from war, Eliza died and he poured himself into the times. That yeah. was that was all he had. Now, for as inflammatory and horrible as he was, he also made huge positive impacts on the city. Even though he wanted everyone to be white, yeah. he was still a huge booster of the city. And he used the times to push that agenda. He told people in it how great the city was and how bright and white the future was. Uh, Real bright. (laughs) Like reflectively bright. (laughs) Eliza wrote poems when she was alive about how great it was to live in LA. On January 1st, 1885, they did their first midwinter edition, which was basically a tourism ad for LA showing how good the weather was in the winter. And they got this shipped into cold cities all over the country to make people like, oh God, I got to move. And this combined with the low Southern Pacific and Santa Fe Railroad fees at the time, it was no coincidence that during Harris since tenure at the helm of the Times, the city's population grew from 12,000 when he started to over 500,000. He created the Chamber of Commerce in 1888. He tipped the scales away from the new port of LA being built in Santa Monica and into San Pedro with if Southern Pacific had gotten their way and it was built in Santa Monica with only Southern Pacific trains having access to it, the city would never have become home of the busiest port in the country. That yeah. would not have happened without him. Harrison, as weird as this sound, he wanted the port to be free access to mm-hmm. everybody. In typical Harrison fashion, he wrote about Collis P. Huntington in Southern Pacific on the issue. He said, he said to me, he said, is this a community of independent American citizens or one we vassals of a bandit who has neither bowels of compassion, common decency, nor an organ in his putrid carcass so great as his gall? Wow. I love these insults. Of course, we know he helped get the aqueduct built by using the times to scare the city into believing they needed an aqueduct immediately. Yeah. But again, the valley wouldn't have become what it is without this aqueduct. Because of his political connections in D.C. and now the Times, Harrison was without a doubt the most powerful person in Los Angeles. He was called the single most important force in Los Angeles aside from the government itself. Wow. And he used that power to turn the Times into a political force. It's been said that no American newspaper has dominated a city the way the Los Angeles Times has dominated Los Angeles. They say it over and over again, but it is true. The LA Times invented LA as we know it. They brought the population, they brought the water, they brought the commerce from the port, and this was all Harrison's doing. Yeah. Like He spearheaded this. Between him and the guys you're about to talk about and their wives, they are probably the most important family in LA history. They are. They are. Definitely. I know I said probably, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> By 1914, he was getting a little too old for the game, so he gave controlling interest in the paper to to his daughter and her husband, who you're going to talk about. But he still managed the day-to-day stuff until the day he died, which was July 30th, 1970, at age 80. He died in bed after eating breakfast. His last words were to his maid, who was serving breakfast. He said, take the tray away. I am gone. (laughs) And the cause of death, a rupture of the heart. Broken heart. What becomes of the the ruptured hearted? hearted. Buried. His funeral was at the First (laughs) Congregational Church, not far from his house. He's at Hollywood Forever now, if you want to say hi. During his last day, he got uncharacteristically charitable, though. He had a Darth Vader uh, <laughs> reversal at the end. He became obsessed with calling for an alliance of nations to end all global conflicts. And this was before World War One even ended. And wow. they did that sort of thing, yeah. which didn't work. But still, he also <laughs> will allow one more. <laughs> he also never showed an interest in art during his life. But when he died, he left the bivouac to L.A. County to be used continuously and perpetually for the arts and advancement of the arts. This became the Otis Institute. Oh, OK. Harrison Gray, Otis. Otis. In 1918, which was the first public independent professional school of art in Southern California, it stayed, it was his house until 1997. A statue of him was put up in MacArthur Park in 1920. It was paid for by his rich friends like Henry Huntington and it was made by Paul Trubitskoy, who was a Russian.
Egyptian prince, and the statue was of a newsboy looking one way and a soldier pointing down Wilshire looking the other way. It's now in a different spot in the park, so it's not quite pointing down Wilshire anymore. And in 1996, there was a third part of the sculpture, which was a younger soldier that went missing and no one can ever find it. He walked away, obviously. (laughs) So that's the first part of uh, the LA Times. We're going to take a a little bit of a break here. We just want to remind you, use Fork Spot. (laughs) Do it. Do it. It's good. It works very, uh, it's very efficiently. It's very easy. Yeah. We mentioned this now because this is the midway point of the episode. If you want to take a break, use the Fork Spot app, get some food. You can use it. Use the promo code Meekly. You get $15 to spend worth of uh, food. Get something to eat. Come back to this. And we're back. (laughs) What'd you get me? What'd you eat? Huh? Did you tip? Was the creator of the restaurant you went to founders of Los Angeles? Yeah. Did you eat at the Otis Institute? <laughs> now you're going to be covering... Let me walk you through what happened. I decided that I wanted to tackle the Chandlers. The, the, the Chandler Bong? The Chandler Bong. The friggin' Chandler dynasty in the Los Angeles Times. And I concentrated a little bit too much on Harry Chandler because he's that perfect 1920s Los Angeles era that I'm fascinated with and then I gave some attention to everybody else. But also you didn't go into Dorothy Chandler and like the wives and stuff because that's a whole different thing. We'll get to buff. You keep saying buff and you keep flexing at me. I don't get it. That's what they call Dorothy Chandler. Um, oh. This segment's called The Mighty Present. We'll I get don't to get it. it. We'll get there. <laughs> We've talked about the founders of the city before. People like William Mulholland and Henry Huntington whose wealth and drive helped make... And Harrison Gray Otis. And Harrison Gray Otis, obviously. Walrus man. <laughs> he was the walrus. <laughs> their wealth and their drive helped make huge advancements. They turned a sleepy little Pueblo town into a modern American city. <laughs> into an exhausted little <laughs> <laughs> Put me to bed. But these men really don't hold a candle to the Chandler, starting with Harry, who is truly responsible for so many essential elements to the city, him and Harrison Gray Otis. Right. Professionally, he is succeeded by his son Norman and then his grandson Otis. And there is cro- there is overlap between what I was talking about and Harry coming yeah. in also. Uh, you should have called this one a Harry situation. Harry and the Harrisons, that's it. That's pretty funny. All this influence over the city made possible by their positions at the LA Times. Harry Chandler was born in May of 1864 in Landaff, New Hampshire. He was a descendant of William Chandler, who immigrated from England to Massachusetts in 1637. Hmm. That is a crazy long time ago. That's old white people. <laughs> that's old That's old white people. <laughs> Harry's parents were listed in the census as being workers in a bobbin factory in 1880. It's a bobbin factory. I couldn't find out too much about like bobbin what... bobbin pins? Th- I couldn't find out too much about Harry's childhood, but it is known that... As a small child, Harry would earn money working as a model for a local photographer. Weird. So it's 1882. And Harry... Is he the one in those centerfolds that they were printing in yeah, the Times? He's, uh, yeah, he was like old-timey cartoons where it's just like a butt through those old-timey pajamas that have yeah. the buttons. Get a load of this. And that, and people thought it was so funny. Butts you know, little... are the funniest thing. It's if 18... only they were pills to get your butt hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the that hardest would butt be I've ever seen. 1882. And Harry is in his late teens. He, now he just arrived at Dartmouth to get an education, mm. but not too long into his college that's years. That's an old white school. <laughs> that's a super white school. It's his college years. He's a young man, and he does the most college thing. He does a keg stand. He does a keg stand on a long board going to class. Um, a classmate of his <laughs> dared Harry to dive into a vat of starch that had frozen over in the first cold snap of the season, which S- it's described as like an icy crust. Starch? starch. Like potato starch? Like, I guess so, yeah. That was fun for an old white family. In yeah, in 1882 yeah, in Dartmouth. I bet you won't do something stupid. Probably will. And probably will indeed. He accepted the dare and must have thought, I'm not an idiot. I would never dare do anything that would alter my entire life. I'm just gonna jump into this freezing cold vat of starch. And he does. And he gets out and he he has his street cred intact, of course, but then he has a high fever and a hacking cough. This is followed by a hemorrhage of the lungs. Oh my god! From jumping into the vat of starch, potato he gets, fever. That was the first name of the potato famine. Was potato fever? And <laughs> we all get this guy a hot potato, but no one could get it to him because <laughs> kept dropping it. This is what he's going through: hemorrhage of the lungs, number one; number two, pneumonia, and even more upsetting to working class parents, number three, his withdrawal from college. Um, <laughs> the combination of freezing anything and yeah. also. That, you can't have that much starch around you. But also, this sounds like what happened to George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. You're right. <laughs> it does. Th- oh, my God. He fell He fell into the frozen pond trying to save his brother, and mm-hmm. then he lost his hearing. That caused that he couldn't go to war or whatever. He had um, to stay home. The threat of tuberculosis loomed over Harry Chandler after mm-hmm. this incident. It was determined very quickly what he needed. I know to- a city he could go to. A Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> the jewel of the West. <laughs> it was determined very quickly what he needed to get over. This respiratory ailment was, like you said, 
Sunshine. So it's the next the land year. of sunshine. Land of sunshine. Just buy a magazine. You don't need to leave. You don't need to leave Dartmouth. It's 1883. It's the next year, and the Chandlers put Harry on the train and sent him west to Southern California. Down Wait, they didn't go with him. No. So their very sick son. Their very the sick son. Remedy is send him on a train alone, alone to, across the country to what we can only imagine is the wild west. Of the wild west, where the sun never sets, and then come back in like an hour. Like you just need to charge your batteries, which don't exist. <laughs> it meant something different back then. You need to heat your coil. <laughs> Once in town, he found a room in a downtown flop house. Over a short period of time, he was thrown out of many boarding houses because of his hacking cough. They didn't like to hear it. But luckily, while wandering around looking for work, he ends up on the Coenga Pass, which was then part of the vast ranch of Isaac Van Nuys. There, he met a retired physician who also came to Los Angeles so the sunshine could cure his health. This man offered him room and board in exchange for manual labor in his orchard. What he, better thing for a guy with uh, pneumonia? Pneumonia and a hacking cough yeah. is to, like, you want to be outside? Pick up a shovel. Stuff. Start picking stuff up stupid what are you stupid or ugly uh, he wasn't ugly he was a butt model he'd be plowing and harvesting orange and grapefruit trees like on the fruit crate labels uh, he settled down and lived in a tent while working the fields he broke horses which means you just trained them to be ridden it doesn't Picked mean them <laughs> drop them uh, he harvested fruit for farmers in return for a share of their crops which he then sold to threshing crews so he was able to make his own money as mm. well as earning room and board he was able to start raising money to head back home when his lungs were cured this life was a he had to sell his lungs to make profit this life was a far cry from the cush sweater tied around your neck life of a college boy while he was staying here harry did not care for los angeles he called los angeles a crude little frontier town oh it's actually it's a sleepy wrong. little pueblo yeah. town <laughs> he's in town and he's not feeling great about it he's feeling really lonely and homesick and regular sex. pneumonia. sick pneumonia <laughs> home pneumonia and regular pneumonia you got two illnesses <laughs> both are terminal the cure for one is to stay here the cure for the other is to go home so what do you pick wandering through the streets he chanced to see into a window of a photographer and he was looking at these photos and a collection of a beautiful these beautiful little children these little cherubs <laughs> among these photographs was one of a little boy whispering into a little girl's ear and it was him as a child because he used to take photos as a model so he it's an odd experience he bought the picture and he claims that this was his cure to homesickness he was able to kind of make it through his stay in los by angeles by looking at a picture of himself as being a baby? on the other side of the continent where you never expect to see yourself as a child and then you see yourself how think about how weird that is what that's a weird, weird coincidence okay. that would be but that's still weird like oh, i miss home better look at this picture of me as a baby i'm where i'm supposed to be must okay. have been the thought he yeah. was going through he was um, looking for a sign he was looking for a sign and what he got was a picture actually do you have any signs <laughs> can you make a sign out can of you it? make a sign out of this he still wanted to go home but after some time you know like i'm not sure how long <laughs> this but picture will keep me going for a while <laughs> he raised three thousand dollars doing manual labor stuff and he was able wow. to go back east in 1884 and i'm not sure how soon his illness came back but many things i read used the word immediate or <laughs> immediately i bet you won't jump into that barrel of starch <laughs> again <laughs> this train departs in a big vat of starch you okay with that <laughs> within the first year back his health declined and there was only really one answer for it again yeah. sunshine harry chandler headed back to los angeles to his destiny now it's 1885 and harry has to get comfortable in los angeles because he has to live here now he's now 21 years old and looking for a place to make some money upon his return he found a job that was less physical than his field work he found a job with the la times no readings i covered make this out to be a monumental decision or achievement there's no story there they were, like they were looking for someone and he was looking mm -hmm. for a job and that was it and he began working for the la times yeah. he began his newspaper career as a clerk in the circulation department a truly humble position when you think about where his story goes in 1888 harry got married to a woman named magdalena or may schlater who was the sister of fellow clerk at the times may and harry had a daughter francesca they lived on roses street near the old la times building wait so he that. married this lady this lady okay that's not who he's supposed to marry <laughs> you mentioned destiny before that's not his destiny his destiny is to marry the girl that whatever happens and is a wonderful life i've, I've only seen it one time to marry that mousy old librarian that mousy old librarian <laughs> oh no what a cruel fate she has a pension <laughs> oh, 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 mary, oh, mary 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 give it up who made you wear his glasses mary you look so dorky mary without a good husband in your life you become a nerd mary they were all compliments back then mary you're a dowdy old loser and i mean that in the best possible way <laughs> Okay, so they're living in downtown and uh, walking distance to the Times building, the fortress. He then purchased several newspaper routes and began handling his own delivery and collections because at the time you could deliver as an independent contractor. So you could buy your own routes and deliver on your own and make your own money from okay. the paper. He hired carriers and he and his carriers delivered the papers in wagons every morning. They delivered on saddle horses and when bicycles came along, they did bicycles. They <laughs> rode a bicycle on a horse. They, <laughs> they crossed the LA River in rowboats during floods, which we wow. know about. Yeah, well, they saved the horse. The 
Bobo was on the back of the horse who was drowning underwater. <laughs> he recalls even delivering papers to a young man hand drilling for oil at Second Street Park. Hmm. This man was Edward Doheny. Hmm. It's such like Los Angeles year one <laughs> stuff. Yeah. In 1887, at the age of 23, he was promoted to circulation manager, and then he was promoted shortly after that to general manager. He also started buying stock in the Times. So it seems that the Times became his life. Just like Harrison Gary. the Times they were changing? Did someone make that joke already? Well, the times were... Ch- oh, you just we just did that. Um, soon enough, he got the attention of the big boss, Harrison Gray Otis, who admired the young man's discipline. He admired his drive. Handsome guy. He was described I like as, the cut of your butt. <laughs> you which is a centerfold. Yeah. I opened up the paper, and it was my butt. Uh, and I knew I was home. I knew that I, well, I belonged here. <laughs> Chandler was described as thrifty, calculating, and aggressive. What a compliment. What a, Those all meant nice things three, back then. Nah, <laughs> the three things you want to be. This was his Twitter bio. He was sniveling. <laughs> <laughs> he was foul mouth. He did whatever I said. <laughs> One thing I read was that he wanted to crowd the competition, which was the Tribune, and he wanted to keep them busy so they wouldn't be delivering papers. His plot to do so was to arrange a picnic outing in the desert and invited a majority of the Tribune carriers to it, keeping them there happy and well fed but most Wait importantly <laughs> busy and far away so harry chandler did this yeah he invited the delivery boys for the other newspaper into the desert for and a that, picnic that's ridiculous. and it was like a legitimate picnic and that, it was you like know a good what? picnic he's gonna make a great son-in-law <laughs> to harrison Gray Otis. slice off the old but <clears throat> but <laughs> <laughs> tragedy strikes in 1892 when harry's wife magdalena died suddenly from i've never heard of this before so i'm probably gonna say it wrong pneumonia pneumonia Peyupero fever, which is an infection she got after childbirth. It's a, it's something that happens, an infection you get after. She gave birth and the it. baby lived, Alice May, and the mom didn't. Hmm. So his wife's dead. It's very truly sad, but the death of his wife led to a networking opportunity when two years later, he married the boss's daughter, yeah. Emma Marion Otis. He is now a husband again. His daughters have a new mother, but more importantly, I'm Harrison Gray Otis's son-in-law. <laughs> but this isn't to say that his promotion was based on nepotism. Chan- they, again, perfect for that family. They see a death and it's a power vacuum for them. What does this death mean for me? Yeah. Well, what I was saying was his promotion was not based on nepotism. Chandler's hustle got him recognized by the upper crust and now his placement in the family has solidified his destiny the two men worked very well together they worked alike they thought alike they both hated labor unions unlike otis though harry Chandler was very much against public appearances he was not boastful and boisterous like he was prolific when it came to industry and business ventures but despised discussing these ventures outside of business environments he was like a sniper like if harrison gray otis is a machine gun cannon yeah. thing it's uh, a cannon filled with nails <laughs> <laughs> harry chandler is like a sniper shot this right. in the dark and just precise <laughs> he's daggers in the night which is another lord of the rings reference <laughs> i'll walk you don't think i will they walked all the way to mordor <laughs> in 1910 the city's population has started to grow slowly topping at about 32,000 people also this is the year that the damn building blows up the pe red cars were now operating all over the city from downtown to long beach so we're now we were a proto city among the newcomers to la was a young theatrical director dw griffith along with a 16 year old girl named mary pickford who was making her first la origins <laughs> year one they were escaping the filming catastrophes of the east coast climates among the movies he makes in the valley birth of an ancient uh <laughs> listen to episode better business broadcast for more on about that movie and what president did he film that in the valley he filmed it in the valley i bet i could pinpoint where i bet it wasn't hard <laughs> to drum up some clan outfits in yeah. the valley he just went to silmar the <laughs> northern part of silmar <laughs> up by the hills they have always been there <laughs> harry saw the potential of having films being shot in los angeles so he took an active role in encouraging the hmm. movie industry to make los angeles a headquarters again these people invented los angeles yeah they invented harry chandler in particular the craziest thing is like he liked movies he just saw <laughs> how can i exploit this how can like, yeah. I'll, we'll get to it he wanted los angeles to be the headquarters of such classics as marley and me and stop or my mom will shoot there's a story behind his shady dealings he made it his business to know how movies were shot and understood that artificial lighting had not reached the intensity required to photograph interior scenes and therefore camera and crews were relying on the sun if you want to shoot indoors it was like three walls and yeah. an open ceiling so if you wanted a sunny day you had to be in the sun and that's temperamental through the times correspondent in san francisco chandler was able to keep track of the weather and when a long period of fog settled over the bay chandler urged the la chamber of commerce to send a mission north with a message that the sun was always shining in los angeles so they found a film crew that was idle and disgruntled because of the fog and said how about we load up all your stuff in a train and we take all you guys to los angeles and you could film there because the sun always shines there pretty much ending san francisco's movie <laughs> aspirations the movie industry could have been split between san francisco right. and los angeles but they, they had their people up there like, Hey, if they want fog, if you want to, if you love your fog so yeah, much, you, love you your can't fog have so movies. Much. You love all your seagulls in every shot. 
I've been there. I get it. They didn't make another movie there till Dirty Harry. <laughs> <laughs> to help promote LA as the film hub, the LA Times launched the first motion picture page in American journalism. It was called Preview, which grew eventually into a Sunday section. They also added a columnist devoted entirely to Hollywood gossip, which is just like, did you hear what Mary said? Because there's only like three people. Outside. This woman was went by the name Stella Stargazer. In 1917, General Otis passes away. Marion and Harry published his deathbed statement for the Times and for the city. It was the fundamental injunctions on how the co-heirs should assume the high trust and valuable property of the LA Times. I'm going to read his dying thing. So this was Harrison Gray Otis's letter to to Harry and to Marion. Which but also he, sounds like their names, by the way. Yeah. Oh my god, it does. <laughs> Should I read it in old-timey voice or dying old man voice? Make sure your throat hurts a lot after this. You know and will <laughs> always bear in mind the paramount fact that this journal is and must continue to be first a newspaper, a vehicle for the dissemination of current news and reports and information, a faithful recorder of the contemporaneous history of public affairs of new knowledge of the tremendous daily happenings of the mighty present all around the globe no matter what nature or complexion the occurrence may be provided they possess human interest moreover the times being a proper medium for thinkers they will be given as always in the past impartial hearings in its broad columns whenever they are able to enlighten the world or contribute to those transcendent problems of human life human living and human government which if they are to be wisely solved will require the best thought and effort of the best men and women upon on earth does that sound like harrison gray otis at all no no not at all it doesn't sound like harry chandler either <laughs> <laughs> who wrote this in the columns of the times will be found i doubt not by the way he writes like jack kerouac like the first <laughs> sentence break is like six lines in in the columns well, they were from the same town <laughs> in the columns of the times will be found and i doubt not in the future as in the past graphic accounts of the doings of the far-flung human race absorbing narratives of adventure and achievement of research and investigation of travel and discovery of progress in the arts sciences and invention of toil and travel triumph of hardship and endurance and ultimate success of everything indeed that is new to men and living interest the press is a colossal surveyor of the worldwide news field scanning the entire civilized globe and faithfully purveying to an ever waiting public the luminous record of daily and might happenings among men and nations uh he doesn't do that i don't know what he wanted from that letter <laughs> i don't understand what he was saying just the thing about like everyone gets their fair story like doesn't sound like anybody no. who's in charge now harry's in a comfortable position he's doing well financially and here's where he starts becoming the father of modern los angeles what drives the city forward is what most people in los angeles are trying to get rich on boosterisms mm -hmm. as i call them here are some of the things that chandler was involved in the water supply of los angeles you talked about a little bit the aviation industry hollywood both as the film capital of the world and most important to him real estate he missed the train on oil unfortunately when he got offered signal hill for dirt cheap and he declined not knowing that there was black gold under that <laughs> dirt cheap so now it's 1920s and we stayed on this podcast before this decade saw a huge boom in the population of the city reaching the millions for the first time. It was a boom era for the LA Times as both in circulation and advertising and the paper started growing rapidly. For three consecutive years, 1921 to 1923. It's a lot of erection pills. A lot of boners. It was a town of boom and boner. <laughs> <laughs> three consecutive years, 1921 and 1923, the LA Times led all other newspapers in the United States in both volume of advertising as well as classifieds. Wow. Well, I mean, that's that's not like... That's not that's editorials. Not, no, yeah, that's, that's not, not like, story, like hard pride, hitting stories. Really. Yeah. We advertise for more Mormon bishop pills than any other city <laughs> in the nation. We have more people People looking for love in our back pages than any other place. We have the biggest population of people who aren't virile. Los Angeles, the city of impotence and loneliness. The city paper continued to increase its effort for a better city and state, advocating better transportation system. They boosted agricultural methods. They helped to achieve things like building of the Colorado River aqueduct and the development of Colorado. Of, they developed Caltech around this time. He took an active role in supplying the city of Los Angeles with water, as we know from you talking and you talking the last time too. The aqueduct was thanks to the drive of William Mulholland, but it was the syndicate which was led by Otis and Chandler and railroad tycoon each Harriman who purchased the water rights. They were behind that. The Times also garnered support from the public to supply LA with water, specifically San Fernando Valley, which Chandler owned a great deal of stock in, which is why they wanted to bring water to yeah, it. We covered this. Chandler, yeah, I know. I just he was behind that. Like he he yeah, helped. This is the, the face, the face, we're, we're, the fathers of all this stuff. Yeah. Now we talked about Hollywood as an idea, but what about Hollywood as a real estate? Remember from episode mm. twenty nine, a landmark episode. It was Harry Chandler and one of the <laughs> many fathers of Hollywood, H.J. Whitley, they were trying to promote the area in Hollywood known as Whitley Heights, which Chandler had invested in. To help promote this area, they built a large sign to advertise the real estate, and thus the Hollywood land sign was born. 
Born, which was owned by Harry Chandler in the early 20s. 20- <laughs> Harry Chandler's Hollywood Land is what it originally said. <laughs> Harry Chandler Harrison met- Gray Hollywood. In the early 20s, Harry Chandler met with a young aircraft engineer through columnist Bill Henry. This man was Donald Douglas, and he arrived in L.A. with $600 in his pocket carrying orders from the U.S. Navy for three experimental torpedo planes. He needed to bankroll this little war endeavor, so he contacted his pal Bill Henry. Chandler met Douglas and understood inherently that L.A. needed more business enterprises. He saw that Douglas was far too shy to drum up enough money from these fat cats, so he helped Douglas and Bill Henry get in contact with the head of Security Bank, and from there they got a loan with some other money, and with that, Douglas Aircraft was born in Los Angeles, with three planes finishing in a tool shed downtown. The Navy then ordered 25 more, and then the aviation industry was born after that, in Los Angeles anyways. No, they invented flight. This should be said. He had no interest in movies. He had no interest in planes or mechanical devices at all. He didn't like them. He had a great hatred for cars. He like eventually learned how to drive and was okay at it and with it. But early on in his driving, he would yell, whoa, at the car <laughs> like it was a horse and he was trying to get it to stop. Where are the reins on this thing? <laughs> he was like putting carrots in the, in the gas tank. <laughs> the horn in front. <laughs> Nevertheless, he still pumped money into the Southland's auto industry, either having a grand vision for a sprawled out city or just seeing early on that cars weren't going anywhere because technology does not go backwards. Uh, he pumped money into the auto and tire factories and oil ventures. He invested in Goodyear Tire and Rubber Co. He backed companies drilling for oil. Bill Boyarsky wrote in this book, Inventing LA, which I read a lot of, that oil, the automobile, and real estate were all intertwined, and Chandler and the city profited from all of it. He made money from the sale of cars, tires, and gas to motorists shopping for homes of their own. When they headed into the valley, they headed to towns and subdivisions on land owned by Harry Chandler and his partners. I know we strayed from LA Times, but this is a good time to get into Harry Chandler and real estate. He had liked it <laughs> i didn't mean to take us on a detour there but but he liked it. he liked it his true love his big cartoon hard eyes love was for <laughs> land he really wanted land he, lo- he wanted to own it he wanted to cut it up and he wanted to sell it he's a true spanish conquistador when it comes to this conquistador conquistador the land needed to be watered which is why he brought water to la but this monumental city making element being water was only an accessory to the land he sought to own even oil didn't really interest him but early on he had his eyes set on the san fernando valley even from his humble beginnings when he walked into Coenga Pass into Van Nuys Ranch and he just saw all this land from there he wanted it. His daughter May recalls Harry saying that he foresaw the San Fernando Valley being jam-packed before you girls die which is a Weird way to put it, but fine. Part of his desire for land was obviously... And you will die. And you will die in front of me. I will see it. I will be by my hand. Part of this desire for land was obviously profit. Harry Chandler sought to turn large parcels of land into money to meet the Times payroll after any kind of land boom bust. Any land bust that happened, he wanted the money to bankroll, so he needed the money, but also he just wanted... to he liked to play this game. He'd buy it up and sell it whenever the Times was aching for money, on top of many other reasons to just want the money. That seems unethical... At the least. It's the least unethical. It's really shoddy. He's like a land tycoon. Yeah. Super shady. And this man founded the city. Um, <laughs> and if he were a drink, he would be... Mm. A nails marinating in water. <laughs> I invented that. Every time he wanted to do any venture land-wise, he'd form a syndicate with a bunch of other rich people and they would go into a venture together. He formed a syndicate and wisely invested money in the area between... This is weird. Between Baja, California and Tejon Ranch, which I believe is like up to 405. 27,000 acres, which doesn't sound right. But he made a deal with Dick. Yeah. Dictator Porfirio Diaz, which was a key figure in the Mexican Revolution. He bought land on both sides of the border. They built 2,500 miles of canals and turned the acreage into one of the largest cotton plantations there is. But the land was eventually confiscated by the governor of Mexico. So then Chandler, trying to regain the land, apparently tried to arm an expeditionary force that would overthrow that government. (laughs) But they were caught and they had to go before a grand jury in 1915, but he was eventually exonerated. So he tried to overthrow Mexico. Not Mexico, but whatever group, like the governor or whoever took over his ranch that him and the syndicate bought, he tried to get a force, a little militia together to take it back. Just the ranch he wanted back? No idea. (laughs) But I imagine just the ranch. I'm sure Harry Chandler can't lead an army against Mexico. (laughs) No, but... Harrison Gray Otis could. Ah, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I've got one more war left in me. <laughs> Anyways, the Valley. Chandler formed a real estate syndicate with Moses Sherman, who I'm trying to remember how we know that name. How do we know? Are you really asking how we know that name? Moses Sherman. Sherman Way? Sherman Oaks? What ventures was he in? Was he a <laughs> railroad guy? That I don't remember. Okay, I, that's I, what, I, that's yeah. what I'm trying to wonder. You know, it might have been railroads. I think I it think was. he was a railroad guy. Anyways, okay. Moses Sherman, General Otis, Whitley of Whitley Heights from Hollywood. This group 
form the Suburban Homes Company. They purchased Porter Ranch in 1905 and most of the holdings of Van Nuys and Lancashire families in 1909 for about $2.5 million. They subdivided the 60,000 acres into the residential industrial property, which sold for $17 million over a seven-year period. The 22-mile-long paved highway they built, Sherman Way, connecting the <laughs> development with Los Angeles is said to have... How do we know that name? Connecting the development with Los Angeles is said to have inspired the county to vote a bond issue for paved roads, the first issue for that purpose in the United States. We, they How invented does Sherman Way roads. connect to the... To Los Angeles? Probably before the airport was there, it went all oh, the way to Los Angeles. Okay. I mean, think about San Fernando Road going all the way down. Yeah. Sherman Way doesn't do that, but San Fernando Road does. Most of the San Fernando Valley was annexed to the city of Los Angeles in 1915 when Harrison was still alive before Harry Chandler was in a big position of power, but he was definitely behind a lot of this stuff. Owning the land drove Chandler to boost for Los Angeles so he can sell it, and the Los Angeles Times is his microphone for that. <laughs> in the 1930s, they organized another real estate syndicate which bought the estate of Lucky Baldwin, covering mm. areas that would become subdivided into Santa Anita, Arcadia, San Gabriel, and the Baldwin Hills. Mm. This guy's all about yeah. owning Los Angeles. All of the minor heroes of the city, he bought them all out. Yeah, he, exactly. He amalgamated yeah. them. Anybody that he can't buy, he'll just join the syndicate with. <laughs> Harry is for sure at least partly responsible for many industries in Los Angeles, but let's not forget another legacy he left behind, being a huge dick. Greg, that's not language we use. We call them boners. Boners here. He was the acknowledged leader. He's the human bishop pill. He was the acknowledged leader of the Southern California's conservative Republicans, which meant the LA Times was full of booster ads for Southern California calling it America's great white spot. Mm. There it is. There it is. <laughs> it also meant that the paper heavily endorsed Republican candidates that Chandler favored and gave very little attention to Democratic options. And this is when Republican was becoming... Republican. Republican. <laughs> Republican meaning, who are you? How'd you get here? The who are you? How'd you get here party? Although he paid higher wages than going union rates and gave incentives to employees such as honoring seniority and seldom delay people off. Very anti-union. Very right. anti-labor. It was rumored that Chandler would push for a Sunday column that ran from 1935 to 1941 called Social Eugenics. Ooh, that meant something different back then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please you, say it meant... You know, 1935, <laughs> I think it's at the heart of the word eugenics. Yeah, that was the golden age golden. of the word eugenics. <laughs> The column argued for stronger sterilization laws and Ooh. railed about how society's misfits should not be allowed to procreate. Every Sunday. Yeah, but this was not racial eugenics, like what Hitler proposed. Oh, well, then it's fine. But it was <laughs> certainly in the same league of thought. It's like one thought away from being like, and you know uh, who's the real bums <laughs> but not and just misfits. Anybody, yeah. He allowed this column to be published. He was part of the, I forget what the group was called, but they were very into eugenics. <laughs> the German-American Bund. <laughs> he might have been the Silver Shirts. Remember when I was talking about Tugan Davis and I said, you know how bad he was based on who his enemy was, which was Clifford Clinton. Harry Chandler's enemies included, but we're not limited to Upton Sinclair, author of The Jungle. The Jungle, if you don't know, class A muckracking journalism, which aimed at exposing the putrid and nightmarish conditions of the meatpacking industry, a real progressive novel. Chandler hated him. They led a campaign against him. He hated William Randolph Hearst, well, who, citizen, who didn't, who didn't publisher of the San Francisco Examiner, and Citizen Kane is partly based on him. Listen to the intro for that. I don't get it. What's what Citizen Kane? What's that? Some sort of cane? You ever heard of a sled before? <laughs> His other enemy was Clifton's pal, Mayor Fletcher Bowron, who helped mm. stamp out corruption Good in City guy. Hall, which is another thing about Harry Chandler. He was pro-corruption. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but he certainly knew the deal between political fixer Kent Kate Parrott and mm -hmm. his installation of Mayor Cryer. Like, they knew about it. Like, mm -hmm. Chandler was okay with this. He certainly supported Jim Tugan Davis. And let's not forget that Chandler fully supported when Jim Tugan Davis and the goons posted up at the state line and were turning migrants away, looking for work with guns, threatening yeah. to arrest them. This was endorsed by the LA Times. This was the LA Times of the era. And speaking of the 30s in 1935, a truly beautiful thing happens. The new headquarters, or at least part of it, was opened at First and Spring Street next to City Hall. And it was, is, was an Art Deco miracle. It's so beautiful. And it's, it was only, what, across the street from where the previous building was? Had a corner, I think, yeah. But a different corner than you think. Well, than I think. We all think the same way, right? We're Eugenics? Not. If you don't think that way, we should probably talk about social eugenics. <laughs> it was designed by Gordon Kaufman, who was responsible for designing Greystone Mansion, Ooh. Caltech, the Boulder Dam, the Hollywood Palladium. Yeah, that, is that, that's in Calder, Cald Calderado. Calderado. Yeah, Boulderado. <laughs> and he also de designed Santa Anita Park, which I went to recently. And it is a, that park is astounding, and it used to hold Japanese people. <laughs> we went on a tour of the building, not to digress or anything. but yeah. In its dying days, and we took a tour of the, the building. the last week that it was going to be. Yeah. I wish we had more of this context, but it was still pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I'm pretty cool. Uh, there's no proof of that. Hours and hours 
of this podcast and there's still no proof of that. Uh, <laughs> we'll find it. We'll get there. <laughs> this is part where he didn't say anything. Also in 1936, the Times pioneered in becoming America's first streamlined newspaper using linotype machines, which cast line by line instead of letter by letter, which is what monotype machines were. They were one of the first ones to do this. They also used the largest body type of any metropolitan newspaper. I've got the largest body type right here. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, it happened. <laughs> cool. Cool guy. <laughs> Harry Chandler retires in 1941 and he dies of a heart attack in 1944. Harry stipulated that after his death, all records of his business and personal information were to be burned, including in this was his business correspondence, <laughs> With- notes, contracts, and other records of how he built the city, the newspaper, and the incalculable fortune we lost to history. Super shady. Burn it with this sled also. <laughs> weird it's, guy. There's a weird thing where he doesn't like to talk about business ventures outside of professional things and when he dies that also goes. I don't know. He seems like a weird guy. There was a picture I saw that was like the, a family portrait of the Chandlers yeah. and they're all there and then he's off to the right. Like a, like a visual space between them. Yeah, a visible space between not just him and his family but him yeah. and his wife also. Detached. It's yeah. very weird. He's a weird guy. Awful, but the founder of the city, but awful. So he's dead. All his records are burned. It's 1941, and the Times was in the hands of his new president. They were a changing? What if that's how every paragraph every started? Paragraph and the Times, starts, they were a changing. They were a changing. <laughs> a hard raid's going to come. I don't like Bob Dylan. Um, I'm more of a, a Donovan guy. So it's 1941, the Times were a changing. And also the LA Times were in the hands a of changing? A, a changing. Were in the hands of a new president who had been trained for this, his son Norman Chandler, who seemingly makes no real waves. <laughs> I don't want to say a dud. Come on. It skips a generation. He was joined by his brothers Harrison, not making <laughs> it easier, and Philip, finally a new name, to take on managerial roles. Which was roles. a nickname for, <laughs> for, for Harry. Marion. In 1942 is when the Alley Times gets its first Pulitzer Prize for a successful campaign that resulted in the clarification and confirmation for all American newspapers of the right of free press as guaranteed under the Constitution. What's funny about me reading that was that that was the exact moment when my monthly free online access to Alley Times <laughs> articles was blocked, so I could not read more about it. A beautiful... Beautiful system. A beautiful system. I know that during the 40s, the Times had a huge post-depression, post-war boom, and advertisers and subscribers drastically increased. They employed thousands of people for the day-to-day operations of the paper, so they were employing a large population of the population to work for the LA Times. Norman Chandler, the heir to LA Times. As a young man, he delivered papers in his Model T Ford. He went to Stanford in 1922. He was his father's secretary. He served seven-year apprenticeship that took him through all the departments of newspaper. Super relatable, Angelina. No. <laughs> 1929, he became assistant to the publisher and then assistant to the general manager in 1934. He was elected vice president and general manager in 1936. In 1938, he became a director and president and publisher when his dad resigned in 1941. He ran the paper at first in the same mold as his father and grandfather, fully supporting Republicans and opposing unions. Later in life, he became more moderate, which must have been like, it must have made him look really weak. Someone must have killed him and taken his identity. <laughs> Regarding the 40s and 50s, Norman said, we were kind of lopsided in those days. Yeah, yeah think in the readings norman is remembered for two things and to me he's remembered for two different things norman is regarded as a businessman publisher and he makes a lot of deals that at the time benefit the times because they were changing first <laughs> first he publishes the mirror the mirror which is a daily tabloid sized <laughs> afternoon paper which sought to capture issues related to the middle and working class residents of la mostly yeah, so minority yeah he yeah it wanted to tell stories of minority groups that his father hated <laughs> by the few quotes from la times writers of the day it was a pretty lousy publication Mm -hmm. also very confusingly that's different from his next endeavor he creates the times mirror co which was incredibly lucrative just to give you a snippet in 1948 times mirror acquired its newspaper supplier the publisher's paper company which was based in oregon additionally the newspaper company co-owned along with cbs television kttv the station made its first telecast which was the rose parade in 1949 what times mirror co yeah but harrison gray otis already made the time Miracle. Did he do anything with it? Because I think the whole thought behind Norman was he brought all these old things back and made them lucrative. I guess. So, I mean, it was just sort of like it must have just been like a tax thing. And they probably like owned it, and now that we own the rights to yeah, those but words, now, they, now it actually was is a thing. Well, they co-own KTDV, which is great, and they're breaking into that that new fan angle TV thing. Yeah, I've got two Sometimes. of them. 
The next year, Times Mirror bought out CBS's interest in the station, and the Times began printing a daily television schedule. At the end of the <laughs> 50s, circulation of the Times stood at an average 50,000 daily and 90,000 on Sundays, which is huge. In addition to owning the Times, the Mirror, and KTTV, Times Mirror was active in paper manufacturing and commercial printing. 30-ish years later, the Times Mirror reported more than $3 billion in revenues for the first time in 1987, <laughs> while revenues for the LA Times exceeded $1 billion for the first time in 1988. That's just shooting ahead a little bit, but I want to show you Times Mirror works out. That's one thing. The other thing that he's known for a lot is being married to Buff, or as we know her, the philanthropist Dorothy Chandler. Her middle name is Buffum. What is going on with this family? I like Buff. Buff came from a family who owned a chain department stores in Long, Long Beach, Long Beach Mercantile Co. Buff was a valedictorian of Long Beach High School, graduating class in 1918. She went to Stanford, where she was voted campus queen, and that's where she met Norman Chandler. Norman had chosen a not pavillionaire to marry, so of course the Chandlers didn't like her. Barely anybody really showed up for their wedding. <laughs> they had a child get together, Camila, and then they would have probably many more. I couldn't find out. Mandy Moore was their daughter? Mandy Moore was her daughter. They, they had many more. Man- manual more after they had the child and they were married for a little bit she fell into like a depression not nothing too deep or serious but she was kind of just gray at this point harrison gray otis harrison i'm depressed otis <laughs> she was able to get psychiatric help and after that she started to be more active in civic activities and took part in cultural and community organizations as well as taking a job at the paper in 1944 what's funny about that was that she was about to take a position like a president of the volunteers at children's hospital and Chandler was like no come work for me and she's <laughs> like oh oh, oh. <laughs> She's just made that noise for the next 30 years. <laughs> she enrolled in journalism classes at USC. She took it very seriously. She became administrative assistant at the Times, taking part in everything from supervising building redecoration to helping shape the Times Mirror Co. annual report. She wrote speeches for Norman, and she took a special interest in covering women's issues as well as arts and cultural like matters. Eliza. Like Eliza, yeah. She was very heavily involved with the Children's Hospital, as I said, and the Southern California Symphony Association. In 1950, she led the Save the Bowl fundraising campaign enabled to help the Hollywood Bowl reopen. They helped complete the season and the year in profit. Buff was elected to the Board of Trustees of Occidental College. She was named the University of California Board of Regents. She served on a 1950s Presidential Committee on Higher Education. Some say her greatest achievement was her drive to establish the Performing Arts Center of Los Angeles County, more commonly known as the Music Center. Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. That's it. Buff Pavilion. People won't get when I say that, but take me to the Buff Pavilion. <laughs> That's oh, a club concert. I go to. <laughs> Her efforts began in 1955 with a benefit party that raised over $40,000. This is for the Music Center. In 1955, she became a director of the Times, serving in that capacity until 1973. A huge deal. From 1969 to 1976, she served as an assistant to the chairman of the board and oversaw the design and construction of the company's new corporate headquarters in 1973. Chandler also worked with various editors to increase awareness of women's issues, and she launched the Los Angeles Time Women of the Year program in 1950. During its 26-year existence, the program honored more than 200 women in Southern California. I feel pretty confident saying that I like her. <laughs> Let's not go out on a limb here, okay? The thing that I don't like about her, her husband. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I know Norman Chandler for. He was the publisher of the LA Times during the time that got the city into a frenzy for both the Sleepy Lagoon murder trial, which whipped LA into a racial frenzy that led to the Zoot Suit riots, and he fully supported and again whipped the public into a racial frenzy after Pearl Harbor resulting in the internment of legal Japanese and Japanese American citizens, which the LA Times supported throughout the entire situation. From the idea of like, eh, we should like look into that to like, we should ship them off to it's better that they're gone. The LA Times was so okay with that. They whipped everyone into a frenzy. That's what I know this era of LA Times is for. They do. Norman is also responsible for, quote, making Richard Nixon. <laughs> he was publishing an editorial in 1952 titled We Stand by Nixon. Nixon was an er- like an early front runner. And- the guy that you saw at that art gallery? Yeah, I saw Richard Nixon, and he, he's like, I'm not a crook. I'm like, you probably are. Nixon's campaign press secretary was a former Mirror political editor, James Bassett. They picked him right off of the LA Times to work for Nixon. The Times endorsed Nixon and they blatantly slanted JFK. They dug deep into Nixon. Even always at, on the right side of history. Always. They dug deep into Nixon. Even as the Chandlers, both of them started to withdraw from him. I love Buff because she did not like or trust Nixon. One night, she invited Nixon and his family upstairs for a snack in the dining room and Nixon met Buff in the hallway and asked if she could bring him a double bourbon because 
because he didn't want his family to see him drink it. <laughs> she said right then she saw how sneaky he was yeah. and later said that she disapproved of his deceptiveness, which is what I feel about Richard Nixon always. He's tricky dick. And she said <laughs> Watergate and everything else falls into the same pattern. <laughs> Keep the silverware away from him. Make sure that when he goes to the bathroom, the door's open. <laughs> it's gross, but I want to make sure that I still have towels at the end of this. <laughs> Despite all of that, the Zutsu riots and Japanese internment and Richard Nixon, people still remember Norman's years as the publisher of the Times as being mild and hesitating in coverage. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but in 1960, Norman decided to step aside and let the next Chandler heir step in, and this is his son, Otis. <laughs> From Mayberry. From Mayberry. Town drunk. <laughs> Otis was groomed from an early age to take control of the family's newspaper. He worked as a printer's apprentice. He worked as a reporter and in advertising and circulation departments. He'd be taken over as president and publisher at the age of 33. Otis would be taking over all the Alley Time stuff. Norman would concentrate on expansion and diversification, buying the Daily Newsday in Garden City. See, this is where I, like, I'm reading the sentence and I read that Norman did it. But now that I'm reading that, I'm pretty sure this is Otis. All the readings, they don't know who they're talking about. And I don't know who they're talking about. And I don't know if they're talking about harry chandler or harry chandler <laughs> anyways otis is not like the men who came before him stop what you're doing right now if you're listening to this podcast stop pull over drop the baby look up a photo of otis chandler do you know what he looks like no you want to see should a picture? i drop everything you should probably drop everything just so when we continue you know what i'm talking about Let's see. i shouldn't start this segment how do you spell otis this segment of what i'm doing shouldn't start by acknowledging his looks uh, you mean newt rockney all american <laughs> Describe him. He looks what you imagine an astronaut looked like yeah, in the 50s. Like an astronaut who works at, like, an, we need a model. Like, yeah. we need a, like he a played face football of, in high school. That's he, weird. He's a surfer and a car fanatic. He looks like if Rob Liefeld drew a surfer. Like, he looks like action yeah, figures but, I had but as a it's kid. The, it's the old style of surfer where they're really buff. They're really they're buff. Really and they have buff a, like, and all muscle, American. When yeah. Muscle Beach was at the beach, and you're like, I'm also going to surf now <laughs> on a surfboard. Big it's chest, weird. muscular, blonde crew cut. But, like, overall, not like the guys before him like he looks like he has fun like he works out <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean with his blonde hair weightlifter physique and love of surfing and hot cars Chandler was a quintessential Californian of his generation finally, they finally bred of all off Santa's pure California yeah. eugenics works um, <laughs> he was an avid hunter as well as a collector of muscle cars and motorcycles he was best known for his athletic diversions including his once national ranking as a shot putter he did not do much to dispel this image when he reportedly fled an editorial meeting after being handed an urgent message surfs up at 1230 really He's a parody. That's funny. He's a parody, California. And I like him so much. We're having a weenie roast. Come on down. <laughs> Sublime's playing. Meet me at Dockweiler. <laughs> Anyways, Otis is not like his father or his grandfather or his great grandfather. Why? This ain't your grandfather's this grand Harrison Gray. This ain't Otis your grandfather's Chandler. grandson. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, it is. What makes him different? Because he cared about journalism. The paper had a long history of being ultra conservative, as we know. Even with moderate Norman leading the way, he still was like more that's on so that weird side. that they went the full spectrum. They went the full spectrum. The generations. And it, you know, for a long time, that like times was considered a mouthpiece for conservative political causes. As far as way as London, the Economist magazine regarded the times as a shoddy sheet of extreme white wing viewpoint and white just wing right wing viewpoint oh come on they're both right <laughs> just like the chandler clan its politics were squarely with reactionary arm of the political party anti-union anti-communist it buried all the democratic candidates it was a laughing stock it was basically fox news of its day and all otis wanted to do he didn't even want to make it liberal he just wanted to make it fair so he just wanted to balance the scales if you're going to publish all this stuff about conservative stuff we're also going to publish the other side so it's full a wide range of journalism like double fair. the coverage right there double you can the double the size of the issue that's 16 pages out of eight brother. <laughs> who's gonna pay for that we want to promote mormon bishop pills we gotta also promote mormon shrinkage pills <laughs> catholic shrinking pills which is just like how are you gonna give birth to more babies i'm catholic his words not mine yeah <laughs> i can't say that but i think it <laughs> i think it every time i look at a little family i'm like you, you, you stop you know you go to you, 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 catholics you don't believe you in catholics. eugenics <laughs> so norman retires in 1960 and then comes like i said otis i'm sure his grandfather harry would be rolling in his grave but there wasn't enough room in the sarcophagus to move around so he just had to sit there and take it i don't like old rich people norman achieved this change in the paper's direction with the help of editor nick williams who was hired in 1958 this was accomplished by upgrading and enlarging its staff and they were all really good writers they opened new la times bureaus elsewhere in the united states and abroad and they've developed thorough coverage of important events under his watch the la times would become a nationally recognized and distinguished publication the times won seven pulitzer prizes during chandler's tenure uh, we saw them on yeah the we tour. saw them yeah since they were trying to move everything we all got to take one so i gotta scrawl my name on one of them i got one for cooking in a controversial move he agreed to publish a long series about the john birch society which was an ultra conservative organization which recruited for its base in pasadena and san marino the birchers they sent a letter to the times demanding the impeachment of 
Chief Justice Earl Warren as a part of a letter writing campaign and they were becoming as the letters moved further along on the deadline they became more abusive and demanding and irate until an editor took the letters to the legal department and started looking into the organization Otis ordered a strong front page editorial condemning the group's ultra conservative sometimes virulent political views more than 15,000 subscribers canceled their subscriptions Mm. but the paper made clear its new direction and in time gained hundreds of thousands of readers and doing this he severed ties with so many family members although I couldn't find out which ones were which I can name one let me think Hmm, maybe all of them except for Buff (laughs) he truly remakes the LA Times and he hires some of the best staff that the paper has ever had and they were right unbiased fair journal he really fostered the idea of Los Angeles as a world class city again like the Times becomes his microphone like you were saying every week you're getting Otis Chandler delivered to your front porch Mm -hmm. and it's like full journalism which is really great the Times was a titan of metropolitan changing Under his guidance, the LA Times was second only to the New York Times. He formed a new syndicate with the Washington Post. He expanded foreign bureaus of the paper. He was really good because he featured important stories of civil rights movements. They covered lots rights really fairly. The paper was powerful under his direction. In 1970, the weekday circulation tops 1 million subscribers. Hmm. But in 1980, Otis surprised everyone at the annual Times Editorial Award dinner when he announced his resignation as president and publisher. Just like Bilbo Baggins announcing here. Here's a huge su- surprise to everybody. I still have the ring. And they're all like, what's the ring? Here's a big surprise to all of you. I'm invisible now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to hear about it over the next 14 hours? You're mean to Lord of the Rings and zoos, okay? That is the longest. It's the sound of walking with their giant feet. <laughs> their giant ugly feet that I made to look at. And these two want to eat all the time. Where'd you even come from? Efrenevrin or wherever the elves are from. Where are the elves from? LaFlorian, okay. Yeah, Rivendale? Riverdale? Riverdale? Riverdale. They're from Riverdale. Don't you remember? Jughead puts on the one crown. I feel like we've made this. <laughs> we have. We're, this is an allusion to a previous episode where we made a Jughead, show. Jughead, no. Jughead, no. I'm going to eat so many hamburgers. <laughs> Sauron. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you are my evil king. <laughs> Bad musical. Keep going. I can't believe. Oh, okay. After, okay. So he resigns as president, but he kind of sticks around a little bit as chairman and editor in chief until about 1985 so he sticks around but he's not in charge his longtime editor tom johnson becomes the fifth publisher of los angeles time after he leaves the 80s were a strong decade for the times but by the end of the 80s they saw you know at the beginning they saw the the departure of otis tom johnson left and as well as that oddly the herald examiner around this time closed their doors they it was a scary sign in the times after them comes david laventhal who oversees the company in the 90s and recognizes a small swell in attention before the internet pretty much kills everything meanwhile the chandlers upstairs are trying to regain power once again and restore their conservative lean which reflects in the papers editorials becoming bland and one-sided again wait who, who? i don't know which chandlers the lesser chandlers the lesser chandlers like i, I only really covered the ones that are in charge the, the west side baggins is if you will so there are other Chandlers. Like every generation of Chandlers, there's at least like four or five. And they're all named similarly. So I don't know <laughs> who they're talking about. In 1991, the Times mirror folded after two years of declining earnings. Leventhal then starts cutting costs. One of the first ones was that writers and staff stopped getting first class air travel paid for and they were incredibly upset about this <laughs> advertising was slipping away and not just from the LA times but all print publications this was the time when how am i gonna get my bishop pills what do i have to go on the internet now what is it called how do i even being that the LA times was seventh out of 11 socal market areas for advertising but what was successful was independent LA time publications like san fernando valley and orange county which were later dropped what was changing was the city the southland middle class southern californians were not getting their information from reading the paper anymore it was becoming a dead market this was that era when right when newspapers started to die out and stuff mm-hmm. and then it leads into the 2000s when they were just shutting down times and limiting our article readage while serving on the times and mirror board until 1998 chandler approved the hiring of mark willis a serial company executive with no newspaper experience to start running times mirror when the company was mired in sagging profits in 1995 wiles is not good he started to shed a lot of things that worked for otis chandler like new york newsday which was an otis chandler thing he also destroyed a long divide between the business side and the editor editorial side of the LA Times. They were separated long when Otis was in charge because they didn't want advertising influencing reporting. Business sells the ads, editorials tell stories, and they can't mingle. At this era, the mood of the so company... it's like promoted content or Pretty whatever. much. It, yeah, we'll get to that. The mood overall, the company was uncertainty and skepticism. It seems like nobody trusted any new management and the Chandlers seemed oblivious to the changes that were happening. By 1998, there were no Chandlers on the staff at the LA Times anymore. It had been 81 years since that was a thing. 81 years in the 
making, and now there are no more Chandlers working at the LA Times. In 1999, Willis and the Times got in hot water when it was learned that there was a secret deal, and the deal was that they devoted an edition of the newspaper's Sunday magazine to the new Staples Center in exchange for a hefty $2 million in ad revenue, which is why Otis kept the business editorial side separated. So they would do all these stories on the Staples Center, and in return, they would get profits from the Staples Center, Mm. which is why he built a divide between the two. This deal led to unrest in the newsroom, and the paper later issued a front-page apology, but the scandal stained. It was so bad that Otis Chandler came out of retirement <laughs> to scold them in the year 2000. Chandler- he took off his wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I had to come back from surfing killer waves for this. <laughs> That's how you had to do your job. <laughs> Chandler dictated a statement that was read aloud in the newsroom. I have reluctantly decided that I can no longer sit idly by and watch a very serious decline in the morale of people throughout the times. They are changing. <laughs> and then he pulled out an acoustic guitar, and he played it perfectly, and like he's really good he can do everything chandler railed against this unbelievably stupid and unprofessional handling of the staples special section he also criticized the management for staff cuts and reductions in the size of the paper which he said threatened its credibility basically after this point he welcomed the sale of the times and it came quickly chandler family trust sold the newspaper's parent company the times mirror co to the tribune co publisher of the chicago tribune by 2007 the times truly seemed like a wash in 2000 times they were failing a wash in the times they were unfortunately not changing because a hard rain's gonna time the change in 2004 it was reported that the times average daily circulation for the period dropped to 983,000 subscribers so it was just dropping it was no longer the nation's largest metro daily paper it had lost nearly half a million subscribers since 1990 and thousands more readers bail each year and as do staff otis unfortunately died in 2008 at the age of 78 i forgot what he had he had a a brain disorder and he died louis l-e-w-e-s you're throwing all these diseases at me i've never heard of before well i mean i'm making them up so quickly <laughs> what's um, pneumonia <laughs> in 2008 under heavy debt and looking in the eyes of recession the tribune files for bankruptcy they now owned alley times and now they're filing for bankruptcy right. the tribune goes through a lot of changes and it splits into tribune publishing and then changes its name to trunk T-R-O-N-C. Late- cool. Cool. Last year, in January of 2018, the Times New Room spits on the grave of Harrison Otis and Harry Chandler and voted to form a union. Accordingly. Finally. Uh, finally. It took 100 years, but we did it. <laughs> just as quickly, Tronk announces it will sell the LA Times uh. along with the San Diego Union Tribune and other papers to Dr. Patrick Soon Shiong. Who is this man? First off, he's a billionaire. He invented a cancer drug, Abraxan. What's cancer? He sold Abraxan for $9 billion because of its efficacy against pancreatic cancer. He's been an LA resident for 38 years. He holds a small ownership stake in the Lakers. He runs a cluster of healthcare companies. He operates a cutting edge biotech laboratory in Culver City. And two years ago, he rescued six small California hospitals from a fire. <laughs> six small kittens from his from- backyard. <laughs> he has pioneered medical treatments and transformed scientific experiments for NASA's space shuttle program last year or two years ago he twice visited donald trump just before the president's inauguration he's why it's said here that he is politically independent but maybe just because he's a guy who's running for president there's something about billionaires where they don't care about how <laughs> awful they are xiong bought the times for 50 million dollars and plans to return the paper to local ownership instead of being under chicago-based tribune control funny enough about keeping it local he has moved the la times staff out of the beautiful headquarters at first and spring and made them move to el segundo by the airport he didn't make them move though they the, didn't the, own the they building. didn't own the building the and Arnie they raised group, the rent by they, a crazy amount of money he could have paid it he's a billionaire Every single month he's going to pay that? Yeah. He's what, is he going to start driving Uber? Yeah, like, like he did this because the lease for the headquarters expired and, or was expiring. And since Ani Group owns the building and wanted millions from the Times, it seemed like a financial decision to do this. Yeah. I mean, it sucks, but they now are more independent or whatever. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Xiong seems to want to return legitimacy to the paper. He said he intends to invest and bring stability to a newsroom that has been led by three editors in nine months and five publishers in four years. He is vowing to return the storied paper to prominence after more than a decade of corporate changes, buyouts, and layoffs which have left a lot of journalists feeling really demoralized to end all this an entire story i like this quote from david halberstam Uh, he has a book called the powers that be no single family has dominated any major region of the country as the chandlers have dominated california it would take a combination of the rockefellers and the Soulsburgers to match the power (laughs) and influence the la times have gone oh this is me talking now Uh, another great artist another great artist uh Mm -hmm. the times are uh, changing said greg (laughs) the la times has gone through so many changes through years and so many of those years are a reflection of the values and drives of one family and their vision of the city. But in summation, Harry Chandler could eat my bottom. <laughs> he can model it and then eat it. And then eat it. The, that's the times. And you know what? 
they haven't changed a bit. <laughs> for he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a good, and we're just carrying a newspaper like the <laughs> we're, we're, we're carrying an alley times. We're doing the horror with a newspaper. <laughs> you know what? You could do a horror over our onto you iTunes. Leave us a review. It um, would really we'd really appreciate it. Any help we can get, we're really taking it right yeah, now. Yeah, if you have an iPhone, just open the podcast app, look for LA Meekly, leave us some stars, some words if you want. We get getting some nice ones. It's nice, nice, nice. Nice, 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 nice. Here's are you looking for some words to write down. Here's a couple. Funny, historic. Entertaining. Entertaining. Clever. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Hmm, Thought provoking. No, not for me. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at LA Meekly, on Instagram, LA underscore Meekly. Meekly. Uh, we're on Facebook to search LA Meekly for now. You can watch us on YouTube. We yes. have all these episodes and some bonus stuff, video from our live show, things like that on YouTube. We have a Patreon going right now. We have a five tier area where we send you postcards that we hand write. Yeah from places where we travel to. You can also email us at la.meekly at gmail.com to send us questions, comments. If you have a, qu- a listener question, we'd we'll love read to. read that. So we're not just answering the same three people's questions all over again. I guess start making fake accounts to send us questions <laughs> out. That's what you're going to make me do. I have do. too many scams going. I can't do that also. Uh, or if you want to be... Trip. If you... I, I'm talking. I'm done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you work at or know someone who works at a historic or interesting place in the city, you can email us and we'll come down there and interview you. LAMeekly.tumblr.com is our main hub. We have an archive of all the episodes there. We have pictures that go along with each episode. Closing sentiments about the Los Angeles Times and the history of the city and the men who control the <laughs> paper. Do you have any closing statements? In two words. To start, this was a big uh, milestone episode. This is something we should have covered a while ago, maybe. And we didn't even get into like the reporters... That that nope. much and all nope. that thing that's could not know, do it no it's weird how conservative and kind of gross it used to be but it's sort of straightened itself yeah, out i think I, like, I like the la times yeah i don't when i read it i don't feel like it's leaning any particular way i feel like if anybody no. messes up they'll talk about it yeah but then again i only really read like the entertainment and sports sure. and they're biased i do get annoyed when there's more coverage of the anaheim ducks than the la kings when they're doing better but nah, look who's in the pocket yeah i gotta figure out who's in the pocket of those yeah. boys but anyway that was our episode that's uh, have a good february have a good valentine's yes. day everybody kisses kisses from la meekly chocolates for la meekly mail them to us la.meekly at postbox.com that's been la meekly not a change in since 2013 how many episodes will a man walk down before there's a cannon on harrison gray <laughs> car mm-hmm.